We're here in the matter of State of New Mexico versus Derek Jerome Madrid, D117 PD 2024, number 54. I'll take entries of appearance at this time. Kent Walquist on behalf of the state. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Robert Gorenz on behalf of Derek Madrid, and he appears before you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madrid. Appreciate you coming before the court today. We're here today to conduct a preliminary examination and pretrial detention hearing. Are the parties ready to proceed? The state's ready, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right. So for everyone's knowledge, the way that I conduct these joint proceedings is we begin with the presentation of evidence for the preliminary examination, determining whether or not probable cause exists for the charges that have been filed on the criminal information on October 2nd of 2024. Once we complete the presentation of evidence from both sides for purposes of the preliminary examination and determining probable cause for the charges, the court will make a ruling regarding probable cause for the charges. After the court has made its ruling regarding probable cause, then the court will take evidence from both parties regarding the pretrial detention issue. Once evidence is submitted from both sides, then the court will hear argument from both sides. The court will incorporate all the evidence presented during the preliminary examination for purposes of determining the pretrial detention matter. If there are any witnesses that are called during the preliminary examination who also have testimony that is not admissible for the probable cause determination, but which is admissible for the pretrial detention matter, in order to save time for the court as well as the witness, after direct, cross, and redirect has been conducted for the purposes of their testimony relevant to the probable cause determination, then the court will allow direct, cross, and redirect for their testimony regarding the pretrial detention at the same time, well, right after. And that's the way we will proceed, and the court will allow opening statements at this time from both sides for purposes of the preliminary examination, if you so choose. On behalf of the state, any opening? No opening from the state. On behalf of the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Can I address you from the podium? Yes, sir. Your Honor, obviously, has looked at the criminal complaint that was filed on September 4th outlining the potential charges. In a nutshell, as you can see from the affidavit in support of the search warrant, this all arises out of what starts as the rodeo up at the Lindreth Rodeo Grounds, and a dance that then commenced after the rodeo finished. There's approximately 200 to 300 people there, including off-duty Rio Riba County deputies. The rodeo finishes without any incident. The dance is, they charge $10 per head for people to get in. Somewhat as it's finishing, you will see clips of a video where the defendant's brother, Miguel, a 10th Army Ranger, served our country two tours, and hear about this, he's a big fellow, walking out with his wife, and he will testify as to this melee, this really brutal armed assault, starts as he's then defending someone else and then trying to help his wife. And the video shows there's about 10 to 12 assailants against him. He's bloodied, he's swinging, but it is an armed assault against him. The video then captures Derek trying to assist his brother to get out of there, because Derek's there along with his younger brother, Jonathan. And Jonathan and Miguel's wife, Marina, will be critical witnesses because Derek is, he pulls a gun. He's not a felon. He's not a misdemeanant. He has a constitutional right to possess that gun. And he has that gun out, never points it at anybody, and never fires it. But he is using this because of the deadly force that is being perpetrated against his brother. He grabs his brother, they start getting out. This is where Derek gets into his truck, which is pointed out to the, it's not a dirt road, but out towards the highway. In his truck, he gets in the driver's seat, of course. His brother, Jonathan, gets in the front passenger seat. The 
alleged victim, and he is a victim because he died. It's a question of who committed that shooting. But he gets in because he's best friends with Jonathan. They're the same age. They went to high school together. Realizing that they have to get out of Dodge quickly, although Trent was in his own truck, he jumps in the back of Derek's truck right behind him. On the other side, uh, on the back of the truck, the passenger side, Miguel's wife, Marina, and she's bleeding. Uh, her blouse is ripped, but she gets in the back seat. Miguel goes to his truck, but it's actually pointed the other direction. Derek tries to get out. At that point, no gunshots have been fired. And we will show this. It hasn't. Uh, Derek never fired. There's no gunshots fi fired right there in front of the rodeo and in front of where the, the, uh, where the um, concert was, the dance. It was not a concert. It was a dance. Derek gets out to almost the highway, and as he's going there, he gets stuck in a little, uh, he doesn't get exactly high-centered, but the truck is stuck. And it's at that point that there are gunshots fired at Derek's truck. Now, the state's going to concede, and, and what happens is that Trent was hit by one of those gunshots. Derek responds thinking that he's in mortal peril and defending himself and the people in his truck. At that point, he fires back at the assailants who have first started with this gunplay. Now, the state's going to tell you, and this is a very unusual case, and there'll be some very unusual um, theories with regard to felony murder and charged in count one, as well as the aggravated battery that they allege that Derek Madrid perpetrated against Trevor, or not just Trevor, but Trent, because the state's going to concede Trent gets hit with one shot. He's crouched over, and you'll hear because Jonathan's in the front seat. Maureen is right next to him. He says, I'm hit, and it's a, it's a fatal shot. You can see we don't have the full autopsy, but it's been determined there was a through and through both lungs, severed his spinal cord. Uh, he died, and inevitably was going to die rapidly. At that point, uh, Derek gets the truck unstuck. His brother then flies ahead of him, and they're going down the road approximately two miles. At that point, uh, Derek gets in front of his brother's truck, pedals the brakes, says, I've got to stop, because they wanted to put Trent on the ground to see what's going on. You will hear Marina, who is in the back seat. She can't find a pulse. She can't find a pulse on his neck, wrist, neck. She actually, in the car, she puts her head, on, he's covered in blood, to, in an attempt to listen to a heartbeat. And she can't hear anything. They stop. At that point, again, they take Trent out, lay him on the side to start applying pressure to a wound, but he's not bleeding anymore. Miguel comes over, and, and again, this is important given his military background uh, with a very fabled army division, the 10th Mountain. And although he's not a medic, he did receive the kind of training anybody does uh, when you are actually engaged in um, infantry assaults, which are, and he'll tell you how to determine if someone's alive with regard to those four factors. And he quickly went through that with regard to Trent on the ground. Uh, and ultimately, uh, he was not responsive, not communicative, no pulse found at all. And uh, given Miguel's background of having actually encountered death on a battlefield with friends and colleagues, he said he's gone. At that point, more gunshots are erupting because the chasing crowd, and you'll see another video, they're on the hunt for these guys all morning long. There's bullets whizzing over their head, and Miguel says quite emphatically, get in the truck. They're coming after us. They did not have time, nor did they think it was, and again, maybe there's second doubts, but they left uh, Trent there. They didn't have time to put him back in the truck. They then, uh, uh, and you'll hear where they went, because they were in great fear for their lives continuously, knowing that they're being pursued. Four in the morning, this is now at about 12.30, almost 1 o'clock. Four in the morning, they've gone to Regina, then they're back down near the store uh, where 
Trent's mother owns the store. You'll hear, hear the details. Miguel calls 911. First goes to Sandoval, then is told that this would be in, in, in San Miguel County. Oh, excuse me, Rio Riva. Thank you. Rio Riva County. Uh, they cooperate, and the charges are filed three months later. On a case where the state concedes that Derek never fired a shot that hit uh, the passenger in his back seat, Trent Green. He didn't cause his death. And the state can articulate a felony murder, but again, New Mexico, and I, I had a felony murder trial two and a half years ago, pretty up to date on some of the requirements in terms of how this, our Supreme Court has so dramatically limited that. But this is a case that I guess the state's theory is uh, Derek shooting, and there'll be a question again, obviously for a jury, who shot first, because someone's entitled to defend themselves when bullets are coming their way. But somehow that makes it foreseeable that the other side, for which there's been no forensics yet, of who is the shooter? And, and you can see there's bullet holes in Derek's truck, too. They have a cartridge from one because it was in a uh, doorpost that kind of went in close to the driver's side. But you will see that clearly the killing shot from whoever, possibly somebody in this courtroom, very possibly, because they've admitted they fired shots. But someone who fired at that car, you'll hear because Marino is right next to Trent. He's leaning over. They're crouched with their heads down, with their hands over. And he gets hit, which would be on the side of his chest through both, well, hit both lungs and severed his uh, spinal cord. And uh, that shooter, the person who actually killed him, he's not charged. And there's been no effort to date as to who that person is. So that's kind of the case in a nutshell. There'll be some legal issues, e even after you hear the evidence, Your Honor, with regard to is there a probable cause for felony murder on those facts, and I don't think I've embellished them in the slightest. But with that, I'm ready to proceed with the evidence. Thank you, Thank counsel. You for the State may call its first witness. Your Honor, uh, before we call our first witness, uh, something that the defense said I think we need to address. There should, I talked to people who said they were witnesses, and I asked them to stay outside the courtroom. Is there anybody in the courtroom right now that thinks they're a witness to the, this incident? Okay. Just wanted to ensure that they all were listening to me because the defense said the shooter might be here. We would invoke the rule, and I've called some people, and they're not in the, in the courtroom either. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, state's uh, first witness uh, will be uh, Trevor Case. Thank you for coming to the courthouse. If you do me a favor, raise your right hand along with me. After I administer this oath, if you accept it, please respond to it with an I do. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, sir. You may be seated. I ask that you speak into that microphone during your testimony, and if you begin your testimony by stating your first name and your last and spelling both for the record. Trevor Case, T-R-E-V-E-R-C-A-S-E. -E. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walquist, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Case, the microphone's on a loose stand, so you can move it if you need to, okay? Uh, generally, where do you live? Lindry. How long have you lived there? Um, since I was 13, so the past 12, 11 years. Uh, did you go to an event on the evening of June 1st, 2024? Yes, sir. Where was that event? Um, it was a dance yeah, where was it? It was in Lindry. 
Okay. Any particular venue in, in Lindrith? Um, at the rodeo grounds. Um, did you have to pay to get in? Yes, sir. Um, was it like a nominal, like ten dollars, something like that? Um, so to get into the event, it was free, but to get into the dance, I think it was like ten or fifteen bucks. And you went into the dance part? Yes, sir. Uh, how many people were there? No, oh, no clue. There was a lot. A lot. Okay. About what time did you get there? Mm, probably six, six thirty-ish. In the evening? Yes, sir. Okay. About what time did you leave? Three, three thirty. In the morning? Yeah. Okay, so that would have been into June 2nd, 2024? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, did anything uh, out of the ordinary happen during this dance? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> what happened? Um, so sometime after the dance, uh, after midnight, there was a commotion, a fight. Um, I was walking out to the truck, and there was a fist fight, which happens sometimes, sometimes doesn't. A fist fight? How do you know it was a fist fight? Uh, I had heard from a friend that it was a fist fight. Okay, did you actually phone. see any fist fight? No, sir. Did you hear anything that made you think it was a fist fight other than a friend saying there's a fist fight? I heard a lot of commotion. A lot of commotion? Yes, sir. Did you see the people involved in that fist fight? No, sir. Okay. I saw a, a couple of um, individuals afterwards that looked like they may have been involved in it, Coy Davis and Colton, but that was it. Uh, who are uh, uh, Coy Davis and uh, Colton Davis? They are friends. Okay. Friends of yours? Yeah. They live in Linder, so I've known them my, the whole time I've lived there. Uh, it sounds like their last name is both Davis. Are they related? Um, Coy is the dad. Colton is the son. Okay. Uh, when you saw uh, Coy and Colton, what made you think, oh, they were involved in something? Uh, Colton was laying on the ground, blood pouring out of his mouth, and people were laying on top of him. Um, so I figured something had happened, um, and that's when the gunshot started. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to back up a little bit because I got kind of unclear in your story because you were talking about how you were getting ready to leave, walking to your car. Yeah. Somebody said there was a fist fight, and so, now you're saying you saw people on the ground. So we were – I was went walked to the bathroom, used the restroom across the across from the dance hall, was walking back. I called my buddy out of out of walking out of the restroom. I was like, hey, let's get ready to go. It's 12 o'clock, and the dance is wrapping up. Let's go home. Who was the buddy you called? Joseph Cottable Hall. Was he also there? Yes, sir. Okay. That's when he informed me there was a fight. Joseph on the phone said, there's a fight. Yeah, there's a fight. He's uh, I told my bud, I'm, I'm headed to the truck. Let's roll out of here. He said, hold on, there's a fist fight. I told him, where? He said, right by your truck. I told him, well, I'm headed to my truck. I'll be there in just a second. Okay. Then what happened? Um, before I got to the truck, gunshots started ringing out. I laid on the ground. I crawled towards the back of my truck, and that's when I seen Colton on the ground, people laying on top of him, and everybody was kind of laying on the ground at okay. that moment. How many gunshots did you hear? Can't give you a number, honestly. My more than 50, 60. 50, five zero to six zero ish? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. And you said uh, when you crawled to your truck, you saw um, Colton there laying on the ground and people laying on top of Colton. Yes, sir. Um, in what manner? Were they smothering him like, you'll get this, or were they helping him? What, no, what they, were, mean? they were laying on top of him, holding him to the ground. Um, okay. It was a fellow friend, um, Andres Chacon. So I was laying on top of him along with somebody else. I don't know who it was, okay. but had him pinned to the ground, laying on top of him. Did it seem like they were trying to help Colton? Yes. Okay. And you said Colton was bleeding? Yes, sir. Uh, from where? From the mouth. Okay. The uh, 50 to 60 gunshots, did you uh, hear or see where they were coming from? No, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. What happened then? Um, laying on the ground, uh, the gunshots ringing out. Gunshots take a, a split second. Um, they paused. I picked Colton up, threw him in the back of the truck so they could take him out of there, get him help, whatever they were going to need to do. Which truck? Um, Andres Chacon's truck. Okay. Um, it was parked right next to mine. Okay. Um, I made my way around the back of Andres's truck and got in mine, proceeded to, to leave. I stopped and talked to a couple of friends, acquaintances from Lindrith on the way out. Um, that's when I, I initially tried to leave the, the dance. Okay. Um, <coughs> tried to leave. What happened? Um, leaving the dance, make the make the way to the pavement. Um, as I get to the pavement, I see the trucks that were flying out when the gunshots were ringing out. I could see the headlights and taillights of the, of the vehicles. They were coming back in as I was getting to the pavement. Okay. You said this was about 3 in the morning? No, sir. This is 
I initially tried to leave. I didn't leave till three because of the police officers and all the stuff that that came with it. But I initially tried to leave this by twelve thirty ish, somewhere around there. Okay. And you said when you heard the fifty to sixty gunshots, you saw truck taillights. Yes, leaving. sir. There were three trucks leaving. How do you know they were trucks? It was twelve thirty in the morning. There was light plants out, so you could see. There were lights. Okay. What made you think that those uh, three trucks leaving had anything to do with the 50 to 60 gunshots you heard? The gunshots were following the vehicles as they left. What do you mean? They were shooting out of the vehicles as they left. How do you know? You could, I can hear a gunshot, and as it's driving by, you can hear them distinctively keep going. Were any other vehicles leaving at that time? No, sir. And you could see what kind of trucks they were? But my real question, let me ask this. How can you be sure that after you kind of helped Colton into Andres's truck and then you started to get to leave and you saw trucks coming back, how do you know they were the same trucks is my real question. Just knowing that three trucks ended up leaving right before I left and three trucks were coming back in, I knew relatively who, what was going on, what was coming back. What happened then? Um, the trucks pulled in. I took a left. I stopped. My driver's window was next to um, to Miguel Madrid's driver's window of his truck. Do you know Miguel? Yes, sir. Her acquaintance. Um, from around town? Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, how long have you known Miguel? Mm, roughly three years. Uh, how often would you see Miguel before this? Maybe once a year, twice a year. Okay. If that. Okay. So you pulled up and saw someone you kind of know, Miguel. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I... By the time I was leaving, pulling out, they had said that it was Derek and me, Miguel that they were fighting. So when I saw Miguel, I know Miguel's truck. When it was pulling back in, I, stopped, I pulled up and talked to him. Um, I told Miguel, hey, but it's like the, the fight's over with, you know, everything's fine. Just, it's done. Go home. It's, it's over. Everybody's already freaked out. Just it's done over with. Go home. And he said, F that. I'm going to kill every one of them mother." And he proceeded to drive forward. I put my truck in reverse to back up. And um, when I was why back, were you trying to back up? I was going to try to block his truck from going into the driveway of the of the dance. Okay. Then what happened? Um, I heard a couple gunshots. Um, figured shooting in the air again would wasn't real worried about it. Kind of shocked, but not. Could you tell where those gunshots were coming from? They were coming from the truck right behind Derek. Or right behind Miguel's, which was a Toyota Tundra. Okay. Uh, do you know Derek Madrid? Yes, sir. Um, same way you know Miguel from around town? Yes, sir. Um, you said earlier that you would know Miguel's truck. Would you know Derek's truck? I've seen it before. Uh, was that Derek's truck behind Miguel's truck? Yes, sir. There was a um, Dodge diesel, a Toyota Tundra, and another Dodge diesel behind it. And so the gunshots, so the, the three trucks... Coming back, they were just kind of in a line? Yes, sir. Where were the gunshots coming from at that point? From the Toyota Tundra. That would be the second truck, uh, Derek's truck? Yes, sir. Okay. What's Miguel's truck? Miguel's truck is a third-gen Dodge, probably like a rough at guesstimate, about 05, 06, somewhere in there. What color did you say? Mm, dark gray. Thank you. How many shots did you hear coming from uh, Derek? Madrid's truck. I heard the first three. I heard three, four shots um, at first. Um, then I heard ping, 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 and the windshield shattered on my truck. Um, when the windshield shattered in your truck, did anything get on you? Glass. Okay. Were you injured in any way? No, sir. Okay. Um, what happened then? Um, I, I racked my pistol and shot back at the Toyota. That second vehicle, Derek's vehicle? Yes, sir. How many shots did you fire? Um, Twelve, I believe. Why did you fire at Derek's truck? That's where the gunfire was coming from. Could you hear anything? Other than gunshots, no, sir. Okay. What happened then? Um, my drove my truck back into the rodeo grounds. After you fired 12 shots, you just... I put it in drive and got the hell out of there. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's right. That's exactly what I was asking. Uh, did you go back into the grounds or leave the grounds? No, I went back into the rodeo grounds. Why do you go back in the rodeo grounds? 
because Miguel was still headed back in there. Did Miguel go back in there? Yes, sir. Uh, when in relation to the gunshots coming from Derek's car and you firing back to Derek's car, when did Miguel go back onto the fairgrounds? He was driving into the fairgrounds as the shooting was happening. Could you see any anybody inside Derek's vehicle? No, sir. Okay. What happened when you uh, turned around to go back into the fairgrounds? Uh, the only thing I could see from the Toyota was fire flash from the passenger side and fire flash from the driver's side coming out the driver door and the passenger door shooting towards my truck. But that's, that's all I could see as far as other than the truck. Okay. And then you fired 12 rounds back? Yes, sir. Okay. Then what happened? Um, I passed Miguel going back into the radio grounds, parked my truck in front of the door, and in front of the big, there's a big bay door that you walk into. I parked my truck in front of that and ran into the building. Did you keep your pistol with you when you ran in? Yes, sir. Uh, how many uh, rounds does your pistol hold? That particular magazine held 15. Okay. So you didn't empty it? No, sir. Okay. Did you reload while you were running inside? I did load a eight-round mag into the into it. Okay. What happened after you ran back inside? Um, Miguel drove through through the the area, kind of the crowd of people and stuff. Turned around and went right back out. Did uh, Miguel still have his window down while that happened? I'm not sure. Okay. Did you hear him saying anything or see anything? Can't. I can't recall. Okay. Did you? Uh, see anybody else fire any shots? No, sir. Okay. What happened then? Um, everybody kind of, everybody's laying on the floor, kind of getting their stuff together. People were scattered all over the place, um, freaking out. Um, they were on the phone with the police, the police department already at that moment as to what was going on. Um, they let me know that the cops were on the way. They, they've been called. So. And uh, you said this was around 12:30. How many people were still there? Everybody was still at the dance. I okay. mean, still a lot of people. Oh yeah. Okay. It was packed. Let me ask a clarifying question. This dance was inside of the hall, correct? Yes, sir. There's a dance hall there. How far is the dance hall from the main road? Ooh. I have. I don't. I can't give you an exact answer on that. Rough to me, um, say six, six hundred yards, five hundred yards, maybe, from the road, the entrance. And it's one long driveway. Yes, sir. One single dirt road in there. Okay. You may proceed. Did you see anybody else with guns out? No, sir. Have you spoken to uh, Miguel or Derek since this incident? No, sir. Did you uh, stick around and then talk to officers when officers arrived? Yes, sir. Okay. I turned over the, the weapon I had and, and my vehicle at that time. One moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. Backing up a little bit to when the three trucks were coming back, and you said that second truck was Derek's truck. Did you actually see uh, anybody inside that truck? I couldn't tell you exactly who was in that truck. I know the three trucks. Um, my my brother's fiance had a graduation party earlier that day after the rodeo before the dance, and I recognized the trucks from that graduation party, or well, Miguel's truck from that graduation party, so I knew who, who it was. You said it was Miguel's truck in front, then Derek's truck. You said you saw the third truck, and you described it earlier. Could you recognize whose truck that was? I, I don't. I hadn't seen him in it. I know it was um, somebody related to them, but it was a third-gen Dodge Diesel as well. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't have any other questions at this time, but the other attorney might, so you have to sure. stay there. You're going to stay past as the witness. What color was that other Dodge Diesel? It was also a dark gray color. 
Thank you. Uh, you may proceed with cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Mr. Case, were you there, um, if you're there at 6, you watch the rodeo until that ends at about 8 or 8.30, right? No, sir. The rodeo started that morning, roughly 7, 8 o'clock, somewhere around there. All day long? Yes, we left. We ended up leaving the rodeo grounds to go to the graduation party. Okay. Then you came back, and you said you got back at approximately 6? Yes, sir. Okay. And what time did the dance start then? Mm, I want to say 8. Okay. And how long did you stay in at the dance? I was in and outside of the dance all night. The f so from approximately 8 to about 12? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this fight that you heard about, you never saw anybody fighting? No, sir. So you have no idea who, who it was? Not, not that I had seen the, you with my own eyes, no. Have you seen videos of the fight? No, sir, I have not. At all? No, sir. Do you know they exist? I don't. Okay. Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. And um, so this fight, uh, did you see, uh, as you said, you saw Colton, and he appeared to have uh, blood, blood around his mouth. Yes, right? sir. See anybody else uh, in any way that was hurt? Um, some people with their shirts a little tore up, um, but that was it. I, mean, I don't, don't recall who all was there or what, but just Colton. Okay. But I know. So... Uh, as you had said, the fight ends, and you wanted people to go because it was just a fight and nobody was hurt. There was no gunshots during the fight. Uh, as soon as the fight wrapped up, there was immediately gunshots from the – before I could get to my truck to see the fight and people could break up the fight, gunshots started. Okay, and as this is what you're talking about, you, you tell us that you heard 50 to 60 shots. Yes, sir. There was a ton of shots. You don't know who fired them? No, sir. Uh, at all? No, sir. And I take it you know nobody was hit there right in front of the concert or in the uh, uh, by the rodeo. At that moment, I couldn't tell you if anybody was hit or not. Well, when you stayed till 3.30, I take it you realize that out of those 50 to 60 shots, nobody got hit. Nobody's laying around bleeding or anything, right? To clarify, I was trying to leave right after the fight. And to my knowledge, I didn't know if anybody had been hit by those bullets or not. Okay. I take it it... When you ultimately stayed to 3.30, talked to law enforcement, you ultimately learned nobody was hit by any 50 or six, any of these bullets you claimed that were fired, 50 to 60 in number. Yeah, so you're correct at that. After I talked to the police, I assumed nobody was hit. Okay. Um, now, after that, you discussed how you recognized Miguel's truck. Um, you recognized... Um, Derek's truck, but you yes. didn't know who had the third truck. Right? I do not. And were there more gunshots that then were the 50 to 60? And then you indicated that at some point you saw gunshots coming out of or what you uh, muzzle flashes out of Derek's vehicle. Yes, sir. And you said that was out of the driver's side window. Driver's side window, passenger side window as well. Okay, so the passenger side, which would be. Front seat, passenger side. Right? Yes, sir. And um, was the truck moving at that point? No, sir. It was parked on, on the pavement. So the pavement would be out at the, as you've indicated, there's a dirt road off the pavement at about 600 yards. might be even a little more. So you're saying the truck was not on the dirt road, but out on the highway, the we pavement. Were, we were both on the pavement, yes, sir. So you had left uh, the um, the I'll call it the fairgrounds proper. You're you're 600 yards away, and you're on a state highway. Yes, sir. Who else is in the car with you? Nobody. And why are you leaving? And uh, uh, why are you leaving with a handgun? Second Amendment provides me to to carry a handgun. But that's true. I Same carry with, one every day. Same with Derek. And yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah. And you're saying you only fired after you saw flashes that. Uh, that came from a vehicle, and one hit your windshield? No, sir. I heard three pings, and the windshield shattered before I fired the first round. Okay. A any other damage to your truck? Mm, there's bullet holes from the front bumper, the front fender, the windshield, and back through the back windshield, the back window. How many? Mm, ten, uh, roughly. So what was the distance, would you say, between Derek's truck, Miguel's truck, and your truck, 
Miguel's uh, gunfire. You're, you're saying he, they fired first and you replied. Yes, sir. Okay. Distance between mine and Derek's truck, roughly 50 yards. Okay. What kind of gun did you have? I had a 40 um, Glock, 40 caliber. What model Glock? Mm, I think it was a G17. G17. So it's a compact 40. So your first magazine carried... Uh, had 11 cart, excuse me, 15 cartridges. Yes, sir. And you would have had three left, and then you put another mag in with eight, a smaller one. Yes, sir. Did you fire the second mag? No, sir. I never chambered the second mag. Uh, I take it, um, it, it you've surrendered your gun. We don't have the forensics, but did you know that your shots? Uh, did you know that they hit Trevor's vehicle? I'm Trevor. S excuse me, Trevor. Uh, Derek's vehicle. I have no clue if Mr. they did or did not. Gonna, you don't know if they hit or not? No, sir. Uh, did you know Trent? No, sir. Acquaintance, but didn't really know him. Yep. Now, um, you never saw Miguel with a, uh, a handgun, correct? No, sir. And I take it you never saw Derek with a handgun uh, at the fairgrounds? I've seen Derek at the beginning of the dance, roughly around 8 o'clock, and that was the only time I'd seen him at the dance. Did you see that he was in possession of a handgun? No, sir, not at that moment. Okay. Now, um, at some point uh, after 1230, were you aware there was a group of people trying to find Derek? No, sir. Not aware of that not at to, all? Not to my knowledge, no. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. No redirect, Your Honor. May this witness be excused. Thank you for your testimony, sir. You're free to go. State's next witness. Uh, Quay Davis. Before he comes, Your Honor, I have a thumb drive. I'm going to bring the laptop out and screw it in with people. But I'll give this to you. Yes, I can put a video up on the monitors, but you're going to be using this in your cross-examination? I would, Your Honor. Well, let's figure it out when you need to use it. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for coming to the courthouse. Could you do me a favor and face me, raise your right hand. After I administer this oath, if you accept it, please respond to it with an ID. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. I'd ask that you speak the microphone during your testimony, and if you begin your testimony by stating your first name and your last and spelling both of them for the record. My name is Brian Davis, B-R-Y-A-N-D-A-V-I-S. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Walquist, you may proceed. Uh, you said your name's Brian. Do you go by Brian? No, sir. I actually go by Coy Davis. Coy. Okay. Uh, generally, where do you live? I've lived in Lindworth, New Mexico all my life. Okay. That uh, microphone's on a loose stand, so you can move it if you need to. Um, did you uh, go to uh, a, an event of dance on the night of June 1st, 2024? Yes. Where was that? The Lindreth Rodeo Grounds in Lindreth, New Mexico. How many people were there? It would be hard for me to tell you, boss. Hundreds, you know, I would say two, three hundred. I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, Did anything out of the ordinary happen at the dance? Yes. What happened? Um, I would say around midnight, maybe a little before, a little after. Uh, there was a dance, a rodeo dance in Lindreth, and uh, me and my wife actually went to leave the dance and went outside of the 
the actual dance hall to outside. And there was a little altercation with my youngest boy and another guy named Ricky Hawkins. Okay, I'm going to pause you for a moment so we can clarify everybody. What's your wife's name? Katrina Davis. Okay. And your uh, youngest boy, what's his name? Connor Davis. Connor? Okay. All right. And you said, so Connor and somebody got into an altercation? Yeah, there was quite a few younger gentlemen outside, and uh, I know this Ricky Hawkins. He's actually a friend of my older son, Colton Davis. And he was uh, kind of getting a little aggressive with my youngest boy. And I went outside to talk to Ricky about that. How old's Connor? 15. Okay. How old's Colton? 22. Okay. Uh, where was this altercation taking place? Because you said you went outside. I would say approximately 50 to 75 foot from the, the entrance to the dance hall. Okay. Is that in like a parking lot area, a pathway to a parking lot? In the parking lot area. In the parking lot. Okay. What was going on between um, Connor and Ricky? wrestling, rolling around aggressively, and uh, I went to tell Ricky that he's too old to be uh, putting his hands on my boy, my youngest boy. Uh, and you said Ricky was actually friends with your older boy, Colton, who's in his early 20s. So how old's Ricky-ish? Still is. He's, he's a family friend of ours. Okay. Um, how old is Ricky? 22, approximately. Okay. Uh, early 20s, and so this early 20s guy, family friend, wrestling with your 15-year-old, you thought, hey, that's too rough, and you went to break it up. What happened? Um, went to break it up, and I told Ricky, you know, don't, don't put your hands on my boy. You know, I was up, up against Ricky, too, real close, you know, face-to-face -face with Ricky. And another gentleman come up to us that I did not know and kind of bumped me and pushed my older son. Colton? Correct. Okay. Uh, and you don't know who that person was? At the time, I didn't know who it was. I had never met the guy. Now, I, I've heard. You've heard from other people? Correct. I'm not going to ask you what other people told you, okay? Okay. All right. So this, at that time, some guy that comes up that you don't know comes in and pushes Colton. What happens then? I believe my oldest boy hit him. Colton. Okay. Colton's your oldest. Correct. Okay. I think he's earlier he said older, so I want to make sure Colton's the oldest. Okay. Yes. So then Colton punches that dude. Yeah? Correct. Okay. What happens then? And uh, f the fight was on. It was just a, uh, a brawl from there. What do you mean by a brawl? Until you say it, it's not evidence. So some of my questions are going to be really dumb because we don't know anything until you say it. Uh to the best way I could tell you, sir, is uh, it was like a, a bar fight. I, I was given and receiving licks, to tell you the honest to God's truth. And then the altercation actually got broken up for, uh, I don't know, 30, 45 seconds. And then uh, he came back to, to fight more. That same guy that first initially showed up. Correct. Okay. Um, what happened when that guy came back to keep fighting? Uh, he pretty much bull rushed me, and I dodged a punch, and I went down to the ground. And then, to tell you the truth, I don't really know. Uh, I was getting kind of stepped on, uh, hit. I was on the ground. And then what happened? I was on the ground for, I don't know, probably, it's hard to tell you how long, sir, but by the time I come back up off the ground, I was a little dazed and confused to tell you the honest to God's truth. I don't really, some of that is a blur. When you got up, because you described this fight kind of starting with Colton and that guy you didn't know at the time. When you get up, where, where are Colton and that guy? By the time that I get up, my son is on the ground with, uh, you know, bleeding from the nose. And I want to be clear because you got a couple of sons. My there. oldest son. Sorry Colton. about okay. that, Colton. 
All right, so Colton's on the ground after you get up, and you said you saw blood on Colton? Yeah, he was bleeding from his nose. Okay. Where was that guy that kind of initially approached? By the time I got off the ground, I, I don't really know, boss. I Okay, that's fair. I only want you to testify to what you know. Okay. Let me ask you a clarifying question. Do you know how many people were in this fight? I do not. You identified Connor and Ricky being there. You go and confront Ricky. Your son Colton is now by your side when this unknown male pushes you and a brawl ensues. Were all those people that I just described in recalling your testimony involved in this fight? Or was it just you and this male and Colton? Um, originally, it was just um, I, that man, me, Ricky, and Colton. Okay. Do you believe that after the initial group of people in the fight that others came? Yes, Your Honor. Do you know how many others? I could not tell you. Thank you. It was, it was a few. Okay. So I want to clarify what you saw after you got up, dazed and confused, but you see Colton bleeding. What happens then? Um, it's pretty chaotic. Uh, I go to try to round my family up, and pretty soon uh, I hear there's a gun. There's a gun. A guy has a gun. Could you tell who was saying that? Uh, several different people. Did you see a gun at that point? No, sir. Up to that point, had you heard any gunshots? Not up to that point, not yet. Okay. And up to that point, had you seen a gun on anybody? No, sir. Okay. So you hear some people yelling out, he's got a gun, and there's a gun, that he's got a gun. What happens then? Um, I'm kind of rounding my family up, and then I would say, I don't know, maybe 30, 45 seconds go by, and I hear a vehicle leaving, shooting, shooting out of the vehicle is occurring. Okay. I'm going to break that up a little bit. You said you heard a vehicle leaving, again, until you say it. It's not evidence, so these are dumb questions. What do you mean you heard a vehicle leaving? L let me rephrase that. I see a vehicle leaving, and I hear gunshots coming from that vehicle. How do you know the gunshots are coming from that vehicle? It's the only one leaving fast there, and it's the only one that the gunshots are that you can hear from. Uh, what kind of vehicle was it? Too dark to tell. Okay. Uh, and you said it was just one vehicle leaving? As far as I can remember. Okay. Um, could you see anybody inside that vehicle? No. How many gunshots did you hear? Uh, I would say uh, at least three or four gunshots. Three or four gunshots? And, and possibly more. It's, it's kind of hard to, to tell this. You know, it's been four months, so I can tell you exactly how many shots. Fair enough. Uh, how far away from that uh, vehicle were you when you saw it leaving and heard the gunshots coming from it? Uh, 150, 200 yards approximately. That seems pretty far away. Correct. And you said it was uh, dark and you couldn't see what kind of vehicle it was? Correct. Did it have its lights on? Yes. Okay. Could you see muzzle flashes? No. Uh, and you said you heard uh, three or four or possibly more uh, shots coming from that uh, vehicle that was leaving. Did you hear or see gunshots coming from anywhere else? No, not at that time. How did you react when you heard those uh, gunshots? Um, extremely nervous. I have a lot of family members you know, in the area there at the dance. And yeah, pretty scary, to tell you the truth. Scary, again, until you say it, it's not evidence, so I ask dumb questions. Scary in what way? 
Well, you know, we were just in an altercation and a, a vehicle leaves firing rounds. It's just, it's, you know, it's not a typical situation that I've been in, I guess you could say. Were you afraid you were going to get hit? No, not not as they were leaving necessarily when they come back, for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll get to that. Okay, um, as they're leaving, as you said three or four, possibly more gunshots. What happens then? Um, I'm rounding up my family, and we are fixing to leave. And then it seems like Trevor Case come back in there saying that they were going to come and shoot us. Do you know Trevor Case? Yes. Um, how soon after you saw that vehicle leaving and the three or four or possibly more gunshots going off from that vehicle as it's leaving, how soon after that happens that Trevor Case comes and says that to you? Uh, it had to have been minutes. You know, it wasn't very long. And what happened after uh, Trevor Case came in and said and said that? Um, a vehicle started coming in shooting, and it drove around the rodeo grounds in a circular fashion shooting. You know, you could hear g gunshots. Once I started hearing the first gunshots, it was pretty chaotic around there. There was a lot of people hiding behind, like, concrete barriers, stuff like that, including myself. Uh, how many vehicles came back? Was it still just the one? Um, I couldn't actually tell you. I was behind a building uh, with my family, so I, I could hear a lot of chaos in, in at least one vehicle, but I couldn't tell you for sure. Did you see that one vehicle going around the uh, grounds? No. Okay. So why do you think that a vehicle was going around the grounds if you didn't see it? Well, I could hear the gunshots coming from the vehicle. I seen the vehicle as it first started coming around the arena. The arena is pretty good size, so by the time that it made it closer to where I was at, I was already uh, barricaded, I guess you could say. Okay. So the gunshots you heard uh, coming from the vehicle – the sound of those gunshots was moving as well. Correct. Okay. How many gunshots did you hear? I couldn't tell you to be quite sure. Okay. Earlier from that first gunshot while the vehicle was leaving, you said three or four, possibly more. What range are we looking at when it came back, do you think? There was, uh, seemed to me like there was more gunshots uh, as they went around the arena. Okay. What happened then? After the vehicle left around the arena, everybody said that it left, and I gathered my family up, plus some other young kids, and I went home. How young were those young kids? Uh, we had quite a few people at our residence that night, and I would say we had everywhere from 12 years old to... 22, 23-year-old people there. Did you stick around for the officers to come that night? Uh, no, I, I went home. Okay. Uh, did uh, uh, Colton go home with you? Correct. Uh, what was Colton's condition like when uh, you took Colton home? Uh, he, he was okay. You know, he had got busted in the face a little bit, but there was no, it was, you know, no broken bones, no, not, not no damage, I guess you could say. Okay. Was he bleeding at all? Yes. Okay. So bust in the face, bleeding, but no broken bones. Correct. Okay. Uh, did Colton need to get any sort of uh, medical treatment or anything? No. Okay. Do you know... Uh, Derek Madrid. I do not. Do you know Miguel Madrid? I do not. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, 
excuse me, uh, when uh, you heard, when the vehicle came back and you heard it kind of going around and the gunshots coming from it um, as it was going around the grounds, could you tell if it was a, a gas or a diesel sort of vehicle? Or could you hear it? I couldn't tell you. Like I say, uh, I was on the verge, of, you know, he, he pretty much knocked me out. I was still a little bit, as you could say, rum dumb, to tell you the truth. I didn't have all my wits about me still. Okay. Rum dumb? What does that mean? Uh, I, that, that Miguel hit me a couple of times that, uh, yeah, he put the hurting on me, to okay. tell you the truth. You just said that it was Miguel that hit you, but you did you didn't know who hit you before. Well, you heard later that it was Miguel. I guess I could rephrase that. I heard it that from my wife that it was Miguel that had hit me. Okay, but you don't know Miguel Madrid. No, and I don't know for a fact it was him the one that hit me either, sir. I mean, I was on the ground, and I, I, I had gotten hit a couple of times in the back of the head. Don't know who it come from. Fair enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you. This, at this time, but the other attorney might, okay. so you have to stay there. Your Honor, stay past as a witness. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so, Mr. Davis, this, uh, initially, this fight starts uh, when the, uh, the dance is over, somewhere around midnight? Yeah, I don't think the dance was quite over, sir. I, we were just leaving from the dance. Okay. And however it starts, it's really your son... And in, in Miguel, and they kind of get into it. Is that how it starts? No. Like I, like I said previously, it was actually me and Ricky over there, you know, talking about an uh, incident that had nothing to do with uh, the shooting. Okay. But and Miguel get... come over there to where uh, me and Ricky were having our confrontation at. You're having a confrontation with Ricky Hawkins. Correct. And Miguel comes over with regard to that. Correct. And ultimately, as you called it, the fight was on. The fight was always Miguel against, it starts with approximately four. And in the end, you don't know how many, but Miguel is fighting uh, quite a few people, right? Um, I, yeah, I guess. I have no idea. Well, 10 to 12 people are, are, are taking pokes at him, and he's... He's just trying to hold off the whole group. That's how it unfolded, right? I, I couldn't tell you. Well, play. Uh, you, have you seen any of the videos? There are a lot of videos taken. Have you seen any of them? Um, no, sir, I have not. Okay. Um, did you, did, were you armed that night? No. Okay. Uh, was your son armed? No. Okay. Um, now, at the, as this melee is going, and you see Miguel's a big guy. And, and you're saying there was a group of people taking him on. He's bloody as, as well. You can see blood all over his face, right? It, it could possibly be, yes, sir. And his wife, uh, there was a fight involving women going after his wife. Did you see that? I didn't personally see it, no, sir. In any way, she's bloody, has her blouse ripped. I mean, you didn't see it. This fight is expanding now. I've heard, I've heard that there was a lot of commotion, a lot of stuff going on, but I personally did not see it. No. Okay. Now, at that point, when the fight is, uh, it's kind of been two rounds. You said the first part, then there's a little intermission. Miguel comes back, and now it's a large group of people assaulting him, and he's fighting back, right? That's how it goes? It could be, yes. Well, I'm just your recollection. At that point, do you ever hear 50 to 60 shots fired in that proximity at that point? Do you ever hear rounds going off like that? Why the fight's going on? Or when it's shortly thereafter. 50 to 60, right in that proximity. Do you ever hear that? There was a lot of, there was a lot of gunfire. I couldn't tell you the exact number. Well, okay, because you talked about hearing three or four shots from a truck that came back, and we'll get what's going on. But you're saying at the time of the fight, you actually hear gunshots going off all over the place? I never did say that, no, not, I, not when we were fighting. Okay, shortly after the fight, did you ever hear 50 to 60 shots? No. I heard a lot of shots. I can't tell you the number. I wasn't counting them. Um. Now, when you indicated that 
you saw this truck, which couldn't identify, and saw that there were gunshots that you perceived coming from that truck. Was that on the dirt road or was that on the paved road out by the, the highway? Where was that? The dirt road, leaving the rodeo grounds. Okay. And from where the dance is and the, and the fairgrounds, how far is that from the paved road, the highway? I I don't know. Would you put 300 yards? Maybe I'm not. I'm not positive. Or it could be know. more. Cause six. You don't know. I don't know. Okay, but you're saying you saw the only gunshots you saw came from a truck that came back on that dirt road. Is that what you're saying? I heard gunshots when I was leaving, or as they were leaving after the fight had occurred. There was gunshots leaving directly after the fight, 30, 45 seconds afterwards. And you don't know who was firing those? No, I do not. Anybody? Uh, d didn't see them? Did you see people with handguns out that night? Uh, no, personally, I did not. At all? No. Uh, I'd like to get some clarification on this sequence of gunshots. Are you able to tell the court how many gunshots approximately you heard? No. At that time? I couldn't tell you the exact number, no, sir. You said previously three to four gunshots. Is that referring to this sequence of gunshots or a different sequence? That was, there wasn't as many gunshots when they were initially leaving after the fight. When they came back after Trevor told us they're coming back to shoot, that's when more gunfire happened than the first time when they were leaving. When they came back is when I heard more gunfire. That first time when they were leaving, can you give me an approximation? Um, I would say at least three or four gunshots that I had heard when they were leaving. Approxi there could be more. Could you know what I mean? I couldn't tell you the exact number. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, did you see Trevor Case? Did you see him firing his firearm? No. I take it you learned that he was firing as well. Did you learn that? I have heard that, yes. Okay. Do you know other people besides Mr. Case were firing that night as well? Um, yeah, I heard that the Madrid boys and Mr. Case were firing their guns, yes. Okay, that's what you heard. I'm just gonna, but you don't have any first-hand knowledge of anybody else affiliated with uh, people in that brawl against Miguel to begin with. You don't know if they went to their trucks, got firearms at all? No, I do not. Um, did you have anything to do with finding Trent Green by the highway? Were you involved in that in any way? No. Uh, did you ever see Derek Madrid's car getting shot up? Did you ever see that? No. Uh, Your Honor, this would be a good time just to play this very brief thumb drive, if we could. I just mark it as Defendants A. It's been provided to the state. And, and really, all it shows. Yes, Your Honor. I don't. I don't need it so much to confront the witness because he's admitted there was a large amount of weight. That just shows it. And uh, it shows Derek with a gun, which he's, there'll be testimony about that, but he doesn't fire it at, at that point. But what I'll do is uh, I just think if the court wants to take a look at this briefly, I don't really need to confront the witness. 
this with you, because there's really only two portions to it. You can see the fight, and then there's a portion where Derek's trying to get his brother away. He's holding a gun, trying to pull him out of this brawl. And and then there is, uh, that's really, then there is, the last part was captured uh, off of a Facebook page showing that they're trying to find them as Dawn approaches their all in truck. And, but th that's not so relevant to this with this. But I, I don't need to play it, and I know we have limited time, Your Honor, uh, to finish this by five. I have to drive to Hobbs tonight. I'm starting a trial with Judge Quincy tomorrow at 8.30. It's a two-day trial, and it was it started in June. It, well, this trial was declared after the first witness for the Doyle versus Ohio violation. So, I, I would hope for that we can finish this by five because I have a six-hour drive. I'm uh, hoping that we will too, because yes. I don't have much time in the next few I, days. I know how busy you are. Here's my thing. Yeah. I don't want this witness seeing something that he has no personal knowledge of. I want the people that are here to see what I'm considering. So I want to put it up on the screen. If it has nothing to do with this man's examination, and you're just offering as evidence, do you have no objection to foundation authentication or anything like that? Not for today's purposes, Your okay. Honor. So. Well, then I'll be happy to watch it once this man gets off the stand. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Is it okay if I press the red button? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. All right. Redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. May this witness be excused. Thank you for your testimony, sir. The state's next witness will be Colton Davis. Would this be a good time for me to look at this? Um, Before that, that's fine with the state. So, uh, Carlos, uh, hold on. Can I put this up on the screen from here? for a moment. Take a look at this with you. <laughs> Sorry. There's three different files on here. You want me to look at all three of them? Uh, at this point, just one and two, Your Honor. Number three is uh, is actually uh, in warning shows uh, that, that that need not. I don't, be think, we, I don't think we should talk about evidence. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. So, just one and two so there's a CM chat M, 
IMG 0287 and IMG 1993. That's it. The IMGs? The two IMG files? Correct. Okay. I'm going to try to get this up on all these monitors. So if everyone should just bear with me for a moment. Unfortunately, don't know how to operate it to get it on the screen for everybody to view, so I'm just going to be able to watch this myself. So just to confirm, what I just watched looked to be like a, well, it was a fist fight between a group of men. Um, the first thing that I saw was three gentlemen driving in a truck saying something like, we made it out. That's what you wanted me to watch? I did. Yes, Your Honor. All right. And you've seen, and we can argue it later, but I, you've seen the melee, as well as there's one portion where you can see the defendant, Derek, trying to get his brother. It, but it's there. But we, we can argue that later on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Of course. Did the state need to see this? Have you seen this? I have the videos. I think I know what you're looking at, but I have seen them. Did you uh, watch both of the videos? I did. I'm happy to display it for you all. They're very short clips. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Did the case agent come with me? Of course. That's not what you want me to watch. Was that the first one? That's the second one, but it's one of the IMGs. Okay. So... That was this one. So I'll open this one. Right. 
State's next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The State's calling uh, Colton Davis to the stand. Oh, we're we're going to keep this. We'll keep that. Yes, because that's evidence. Yeah, uh, yes, Your Honor. Right. I'm going to put it here. Courthouse. Okay, just walk right up there, stand there, face me, raise your right hand. After I administer this oath, if you accept it, please respond to it with an I do. Do you swear or affirm that <coughs> the penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, sir. You may be seated. There's a microphone in front of you. I ask that you speak into it while you testify. And if you begin your testimony by stating your first name and your last and spelling both of them for the record. Colton Davis, C O L T A N D A V I S. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walquist, you may Thank proceed. You, uh, Colton, is it okay if I call you Colton? Yes, sir. Uh, that microphone's on a loose stand, so you can move it towards you if you need to. Uh, generally, where do you live? Vendros, New Mexico. How long have you lived there? Uh, all my life. I went to college for a time, but other than that, it's been all my life. So. Okay. Uh, did you go to a, an event on the night of June 1st, 2024? Yes, sir. Where was that? Lindreth, New Mexico. Uh, was there a particular venue in Lindreth? Uh, the rodeo grounds. Okay. Um, was there like a dance, a dance hall and stuff happening in the dance hall? Yes, sir. Okay. Did anything out of the ordinary um, happen at that dance that night? Yes, sir. About what time did that out of the ordinary thing happen? My guess would be about 11, 11.30, somewhere in there. I didn't keep track of the time during that time. Sure. So, um, so but you think best that you can remember 11, 11.30, June 1st, end of June 2nd almost? Yes, sir. Okay, fair enough. All right, what was that out of the ordinary thing that happened? Uh, shooting and a fight. Okay. Uh, which happened first, the shooting or the fight? Fight. Uh, what happened with the fight? So... Enriquez Hawkins and Connor Davis, which Connor Davis is my little brother, they were wrestling, just kind of horse playing around, you know. And my dad walks up to me with Coy Davis, my dad. He walks up to me and says, you know, why aren't you sticking up for your little brother? And I said, you know, they're just messing around, you know what I mean? And he walks up to Ricky and grabs him and slams him against the truck and says, you know, hey, what are you doing to my little boy? And Rick, me and Enrique's Hawkins have been best friends for a long time, since high school. So he throws his hands up in the air because he's got a lot of respect for my dad. And he says, you know, it wasn't like, wasn't like that, Coy. We were just messing around. And my dad let him go. And they were kind of starting to have like a little man-to-man -man talk, you know. And then Miguel Madrid stepped in between my dad and Ricky. And that got me mad. I'm going to so, pause you for a second. Because uh, you said you knew Ricky since high school. Did you know Miguel Madrid? No, sir. Uh, so when you say Miguel Dr uh, Madrid stepped in, you just saw a guy step in, and you've heard since then that that was Miguel. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So this guy steps in between uh, Ricky and your dad. What happens then? They got me mad, and I walked up to him and basically said, you know, this isn't none of your business. This isn't yours to be concerned with. And he pushed me. And I laid one into him, and fight broke out from there. Uh, this guy, uh, compared to you, what? How big is he? He's kind of stand up and yeah, please, uh, if that's okay with the court. I guess would be somewhere, you know, right in here. Okay. And so, did you swing up and hit him in the face? Yes, sir. How'd that go? I laid one into him, and then we we were all brawling from there. He got me a couple of times. I got him a couple of times. and um, So it kind of started out with just you two, you and that person that you're saying people told you was Miguel. Uh, just you two. Is that how it just started? And then did it escalate from there? So, okay. I punched him. And like I said, just broke, just kind of exploded, I guess you could say, from there. So it was at first, that first few seconds, you know, it was me, my dad, and Ricky, and then Miguel on the other side. And then people just kind of started piling in, you know. Okay. When you say people started piling in, um, do you know any of these people that were piling in? A, hand, a pretty good handful of them, yes, sir. Okay. 
What happens as these people start piling in? I mean, people, so I, from my account, I got slammed, in, not like slammed into the truck, but like tossed onto a truck kind of, by whom I can't recall. And I'm down on the ground, I get up, and there's somebody fighting my dad. Again, I can't re recall in that exact moment who it was. All I saw was somebody fighting my dad. So I go and lay another one into him, whoever it might have been. I don't know if it was Miguel in particular or who it was exactly. Okay. But we're fighting and fighting, and towards the end of my involvement in the actual physical fight, I had somebody in a headlock. I believe it was Miguel Madrid, but... Okay. You it believe was it was that first guy that stepped between Ricky and your dad? Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I recall, yes, sir. And there's, there was blood on my shirt, and it was actually this very shirt that I'm wearing today. And I don't know if you can do any testing on that or anything like that. Have you watched it since the sense of I it? have, yeah. I don't know if there's still something there. Or... Uh, we can talk to the officer about that later. Okay. Um, but it was that shirt you were wearing right there? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, we're being recorded by audio, not visual. So it's kind of a bluish kind of checkered shirt? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so you have somebody in headlock. It might have been that guy that sat between Ricky and your dad, but blood got on your shirt. What happens then? So, okay. I have my headlock. He gets loose. I get him again, and I have him for, you know, a moment, you know. I have him good. Matt Stevenson grabs me and pulls me out of the fight. And uh, do you know Matt Stevenson? Yes, sir. He's kin to me. He's kin to you? Okay. Kin, yes, sir. Fair enough. Um, okay. So Matt pulls you off. What happens then? So I try and get away and get back into the fight, and eventually, eventually, after a good couple of minutes, I break free from Matt. And then somebody trips me. And again, they're holding me from behind, right? And I'm trying to get back into the fight. So I don't know who it was that tripped me. But my mom, Christy Post, which I suppose would be her last name now. She's been married and divorced periodically throughout her life. So Christy, sure. Yeah, Christy. <laughs> anyway, it was my mom, Christy, and Hunter Susky that was holding me down on the ground. And at this point, I'm kind of running out of breath. I'm kind of trying to break free, but eventually I'm like, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm not get, getting anywhere. So I just kind of lay down, you know. And it was at that point, I was in between a truck and a concrete barrier by the restrooms at the Lindreth Rodeo Grounds. And Trevor Case comes up and checks on me. He says, hey, bud, you good? And I nod in my head. He goes off. He walks off. you. Because okay. we're about to get something important, but I want to pause you. Are you bleeding at that point? Yes, sir. Out, okay. out of my nose, mainly. Okay. So after Trevor uh, Case checks on you and you kind of nod, what happens then? Moments later, somewhere, I might guess would be 20 to 30 seconds later, I hear gunshots and I hear bullets zipping over almost not by my head. But so I wish we had, I could draw a map for you. But between the restrooms and there's a playground there. It sounded like the travel of the bullets was going in between there, like, you know what I mean? So uh, how many shots did you hear? I recall three. Okay. Um, at, sorry, at, at that first volley, I guess you could say, that first volley I recall hearing three shots. Okay. And then what happened after that first volley of three shots? So crowd kind of disperses and everything. Uh, Andres Chacon and Trevor Case, get me, they pick me up. And they get me into Andres Chacon's truck. And it's me, him, and a few of the girls that had hopped in for safety, you know. And we're figuring out what's going on. And my mom, Katrina Davis, is telling Andres Chacon, and just for the record, Andres Chacon, again, another old buddy of mine. Sure. So anyway. Appreciate that, actually. Thank you. So we're figuring out what we're doing. My mom's telling Andres Chacon, Get him out of here, talking about me. And, you know, we, there was kind of a stalling moment because the people were using Andres Chacon's truck as kind of like cover between them and what the, what the shots were going off. And moments go by, and we get out of there, and we go back to where horse trailers are parked. And we stay there for a minute, and we hear another volley of shots. And that, to my knowledge, was whenever Trevor Case and Derek Madrid got into the altercation with okay. the gunfight. All right, yeah. then I'm going to pause you. So you heard three shots, that initial volley, 
Um, did you hear or see anybody leave at that point? Define leave. Leave the vicinity? Uh, get in a vehicle and drive away. I, I was still on the ground at that point, sir. So, no, sir, I did not. Okay. Um, you said uh, Trevor Case checked on you, and then he walked away. Do you know if Trevor Case got into a vehicle and started to leave, drive away? I did not see that. Okay. All right. Um, how much time passed from that initial volley of th about three shots to the next set of shots? The so next altercation? Yeah. I'd have to say about five minutes or so. Okay. That initial volley of three or so shots, uh, could you tell what direction those were shots were coming from? So there's the ticket booth at the rodeo grounds, and it sounded like they were coming from the general area of the ticket booth, that road that's right there. So they were, they were coming from there, and they were traveling north towards, like, the dance hall and the playground and the, where the restrooms were at and all that. Um, I think we established early, earlier you don't know Miguel Madrid, and you heard that name later. Do you know a Derek Madrid? Yes, sir. Did you know Derek Madrid on that night? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you know Derek Madrid? We had hung, or I say hung out, we had partied together in the past. Okay. Do you see uh, Derek Madrid in the courtroom right now? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to make sure we have the right person in the courtroom. Uh, could you point him out and describe something he's wearing? He's right there in the orange suit. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, let the record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant. The record will still reflect. Did you see Derek Madrid on that night, June 1st into June 2nd, 2024, at that part, at yes, that sir. dance? Yes, sir. Um, when did you see him? I had first seen him. We were we were enjoying alcohol, and I gave him a shot. And that was earlier in the evening. Yes, sir. Okay. About 20 minutes before everything happened. Uh, by everything that happened, you're talking about the 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 fight before the breakout of the fight. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you see uh, Derek Madrid uh, during the breakout of the fight? No, sir. Not that I recall. Okay. At any point during anything, did you ever see Derek Madrid? Not that uh, I recall. During the fight, excuse me. Not that I recall. Okay. Uh, 20-ish minutes before the fight, uh, when you gave uh, uh, Derek Madrid a, a shot, uh, was that a shot of alcohol? Whiskey, yes, sir. Okay. Um, did you see if Der uh, Derek Madrid had a gun on him at that point? No, sir. Okay. Did you see anybody with a gun at that point? No, sir. Okay. Um, I apologize for jumping around. I want to make sure I'm hitting all the right points. Um, were there basically only two main volleys of shots, that initial three or so, and then later on, and I think I cut you off, but you were talking about what you heard later on might have been Trevor and whoever else involved? It sounded like there was another volley, you could say, when it, as they were driving off. Okay. Explain that. After that first initial volley of about three shots or so, as they were driving off, as I was getting into the truck, there was another, another round as they were driving off. It sounded like they were shooting into the air as they were driving off. Okay. When you say they, who's they? Uh, whoever was in the Madrid trucks, or vehicles, I should say. So you, because I asked you earlier if you saw anybody driving away, and I thought you said no, but now you're saying you, I, the, the Madrid's trucks were leaving. I heard them. I heard them leaving and shooting as they were going away. Okay. How do you know uh, you, let's start, I'm going to talk about the trucks and then the shots. The trucks, how do you know the trucks were the Madrid trucks that were leaving? I, I can't visually, can visually confirm that. That's what I heard. Okay. Um, what, did it, did it sound like a truck? Uh, I'm guessing it wasn't a, a, a Prius. Uh, right. What, yeah, what did you hear that made you think trucks are leaving? Just loud engine. I heard the one loud engine. Okay, one loud engine, and then you heard shots at that time? Yes, sir. I was going away, you know what I mean? Okay, the, you As heard they were shots. traveling away, it was shots at the air, from what I recall. Okay, how many shots did you hear uh, going away? Four or five. Okay. And then later on, did you hear more shots? Uh, so as they were leaving, that's whenever I first initially got into Andres' truck, Andres Chacon's truck. 
whenever we had pulled away and went to where the horse trailers were parked, that's whenever I heard the altercation between uh, Trevor Case and Madrid. Okay. So how many sets of shots total did you hear? Not the number of each set, but kind of how many sets of shots did you hear? Because I'm unclear Three. on your testimony. Three. Three. Okay. The first about three when you were lying on the ground and people were laying on top of you? Yes, sir. Okay. And then uh, how many going away? About four or five. Okay. And then that third set of shots total, how many shots did you hear? In that third set. In that third set. I couldn't really give you a number on that considerable amount. Considerable amount. Okay. Um, and you were saying it's it was between Trevor and, and that because you've heard that later. Yes, sir. Have you heard of anybody else at that scene shooting at all? No, sir. Okay, you didn't but, talk to friends later and, and Andres was like, oh, I popped off of Shadow as well. No, no sir, nothing like that. Okay, like all that. right. One moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, that first volley of three shots that you heard, uh, how did that make you feel? I was like, how do I explain this? I guess it was kind of like, oh, it just got real. You know what I mean? Because I heard the sh 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 as they were traveling by, I was like, oh, crap. You know what I mean? This, this, got, this got bad. You know what I mean? Were you afraid? In a way, yeah. In a way? In what way? In the sense of my own life and the lives of those around me. Did you have a gun on you at all that night? No, sir, I did not. Okay. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you at this time. Thank you. The other attorney might have some questions, so you have to stay there. Your Honor, stay past as a witness. Cross-examination. Uh, Mr. Davis, um, I was going to ask you about alcohol because, as I understand it, it actually wasn't served at the dance, was it? You couldn't buy drinks. That's right? correct. So people had to, it was BYO, bring your own. Yes, sir. And, uh, and that's pretty common at, in the Lindrith uh, at Fairgrounds there. That's usually how it works, right? Yes, sir. Um, so you've told us how long approximately you were there and uh, was, to your knowledge, uh, was Trevor Case, was he drinking? Yes, sir. Uh, were you drinking with him during that period of time? I did take a shot with Trevor Case, yes, sir. Okay. Did you think he was impaired in any way? Not terribly, no, sir. I understand terribly, but I guess impaired, uh, it was obvious he was drinking, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying impaired uh, where he's knocked down drunk, but to some extent you knew he was impaired. Is yes, that sir. Fair? Yes, sir. Characterization. Would you say the same about you? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, how much would you, and again, I'm not, this is only, it's only relevant to see how well you remember things. And I know you get you know, in this fight, but how much would you say you had to drink that night up until the fight and then these gunshots that you've heard? I would say about six shots and a couple beers. Okay. Uh, how about your dad? Was he drinking with you guys? I didn't drink with him, no, sir. I don't know if he was or not. Okay. Um, now, there was the fight, and you've kind of described this, and we've seen a video of portions of it. Um, it's really a lot of people against Miguel. That's how we could characterize that. Would you agree with that? He stuck his nose into our business, so no, I don't, I don't see it that way. No, I understand you You think that it, maybe he should have just walked on. And it, But what I'm saying, when the fight started, it was one guy against everybody else. That's how it unfolded. People from his side uh, jumped in, too. Okay. But one thing about the fight, there were no weapons, knives or guns during this fight, this altercation, correct? During the fist fight, no, sir. Okay. Did you, uh, since you knew Derek and actually had a drink with him that night, did you at some point during the fight see that he pulled out a handgun and people said gun gun I, I do not recall that did you hear people do you remember hearing people say gun gun I do not recall that yeah. now um, and I want to get in a little bit these three different volleys uh, you actually heard 
you said um, after the fight, uh, you said you heard approximately that you call uh, three shots. You remember that? Yes, sir. You don't know who fired those shots, do you? I can't visual. I couldn't visually confirm that, no, sir. Okay, and I'm just saying, either by truck or where you heard them, but you don't know who the shooter was. No, sir. Uh, the same is true with the next volley, four to five. You don't know who shot those either. No, sir. Uh, you don't know. I, I take it you knew that um, um, Trevor Case. He had a gun that night. You knew that, didn't you? Not to my knowledge, no, sir. Did you ultimately determine that he fired shots that night? I had heard after everything had happened. Yeah, I, and if he didn't, if he didn't tell you, I was just asking. If you just heard it, I don't. It's technically hearsay, but he didn't tell you that he had fired. He did not tell me himself, no, sir. Okay. So uh, the next volley, and you said it was, uh, you thought it was shots up in the air coming out of a vehicle. The second volley, yes, sir. Okay, so they weren't whizzing in the direction of people they were shots up in the air the first volley was the second volley wasn't I, i'm getting that the first three shots you heard what you perceived and it's a very real sound if you're close to a bullet traveling 450 to 600 feet a second it, it has a very distinctive sound to it so you heard it with the first three the next four you thought that was in the air yes sir and again, but you don't know who the shooter was. No, sir. No. And then, and then we get to a whole bunch of bullets being fired. Yes, but sir. You don't know who shot those either. I do not. And you don't know the vehicles from which they're coming, or where. No, sir. Would you say that those, um, in terms of distance, were those shots? And you talked about the booth, the ticket booth, which is almost at the end of the, at the beginning of the dirt road. It's close to the highway, isn't it? So. You turn off of 595, go down the dirt road, There's, you can either go, keep going straight or go left to the rodeo grounds. Right. Okay, you go left to the rodeo grounds and 50 yards from that turn, that's where the ticket booth is at. The, tick, the ticket booth. Is that, but I'm, I'm just wondering, is that closer to the highway or how far? How far is that ticket booth where you think that volley of shots occurred compared to where the, uh, the dance was? How far was that? Between the two, probably, I'd say, 175 to 200 yards. Okay. And, again, that's where you hear the last volley and a fair number of shots, but, again, you don't know who was shooting at who. No, sir. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Redirect. No redirect, Your Honor. May this one just be excused. Thank you for your testimony, sir. You're free to go. Thank you. How many more witnesses does the state have for the preliminary examination? Uh, we're trying to whittle it down right now, Your Honor. Um, uh, based on who I've named in the uh, as victims in the criminal complaint, I would have at least it, probably at least three more civilian witnesses, um, and then start moving into officers. There are a lot more civilian witnesses, but in the interest of time, I plan on cutting some out right now. So we're working on it. Okay. And Can call your next one. Yes. Mr. Just uh, for housekeeping, Your Honor, I know the state has uh, subpoenaed Miguel Madrid. He's here, sitting outside. I was going to call him in the event the state doesn't. He's a very prescient witness. And then the two people in Derek Madrid's truck, along with Mr. Green, was Miguel's wife, Marina. And we intend on, I mean, she's in the car as well as uh, Trent's best friend, Jonathan, Derek's brother. So they're in the truck when he shot. So I think it's important that the court hears that testimony as well. I don't know if we'll finish by five, but I'm going to try and move quickly, Your Honor. Well, l let's talk about this because not only do we have to get through all these witnesses, but we also have to get through argument, a decision by me for probable cause, and then pretrial detention. You have a trial starting in Hobbs tomorrow. That's been set for since the last mistrial, and that was June 27th of this summer. And that's, again, with your colleague, Judge Cooksey. Uh, my co-counsel... How did, many days is this scheduled for trial? At, at two. It will be done in two. So 
either Thursday or Friday. That's when she said it. I know you have a, well, I've been reading about it, but you have a matter set for next week. Yeah, I do. Um, for two weeks, in fact. Um, I want as much information as I can have in making my ruling on this. Um, Your Honor, what I would ask, and if we could even proffer, I have no problem continuing uh, the preliminary hearing, and I think we'll not finish because I, I anticipate those witnesses that I, between Miguel, Marina, and Jonathan, they're going to take a lot of time. And But I would like to have, at least if we're proffering and the court has a sense of, of, of the evidence, we could just turn, you won't have a complete record, but I think you have a sufficient record now on the state's motion for detention, particularly, and maybe if we want to call the case agent, I mean, as I stated in my opening, this was only what was, um, what, what I was informed before the hearing by Mr. Walquist, is that the state's conceding Derek didn't shoot uh, Mr. Green in the back of his truck. And this is a, a, leg, a felony murder with regard to shooting from a motor vehicle, and somehow it's foreseeable that bullets would be returned shooting his truck and people went inside of it. In, in this case, we already have, I think we know who it is. I mean, if it's only one shooter, it has to be Trevor Case. And there'll be forensics because we do have a cartridge, the 40 caliber. He said it was a 40 caliber Glock. But having said that, I would, if we could just direct and at least get a ruling, because if we have to wait two weeks, obviously I'm, I don't think there's sufficient, and I've seen the recommendation for ROR. Mr. Derek Madrid is, he's not a misdemeanor, he's not a felon. You've heard the context of this. He's not, he didn't shoot his gun. Uh, we're not denying it was fired. Uh, and we can get to that. But he didn't shoot the person in the back seat. Somebody else was shooting at the truck. And on this record, I just want to have him released under whatever conditions. And we can come back at, in two weeks after you're done with your high-profile case. But I, I would like if we could at least address the tension because I don't think he should sit in jail for two weeks this way we, until we can find time to come back. If, it, if that would be acceptable with the court. I think the best course of action is to address pretrial detention at this point in time. I can clear a day after this trial that's coming up next week and the following week to accommodate all of the witnesses for the purposes of the probable cause determination. There is a certain deadline by which it needs to be conducted. I think us beginning it today satisfies that. I think out of an abundance of caution, maybe I'd ask for a waiver. Um, Your Honor, I think the, the wording of Rule 5409 was uh, amended in November of 2022 that you actually have to finish, finish. by the deadline, which is uh, October 4th. Okay. Well, then I need a waiver, yeah. um, no matter how I end up ruling regarding pretrial detention. Yeah, I agree with that, Your Honor, because it, it's really my schedule. You might have... Thursday or Friday, but I, I have a trial. So I, I will waive that portion, but not the pretrial detention, which we have a deadline on that as well. I, I think you need to, I think you have sufficient information, particularly with the recommendation, but I will put on the record, we will waive the pretrial for a reasonable period of time until you can reset it given your calendar. I appreciate that. Mr. Walquist, are you prepared to proceed to, well, firstly, are you, do you find that acceptable? And then, secondly, are you able to proceed to pretrial detention at this juncture? If I'm understanding what we're discussing, we are pausing the preliminary hearing. The defense is waiving time to complete the uh, preliminary hearing, and then we will proceed to the pretrial detention. Uh, I would ask my case agent to testify. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, and then we will argue that. And then regardless of what your honor rules, there's a waiver of time for preliminary hearing, and we will come back to do that. Am I following everything? That's correct. Um, the I, next setting will be in TA. I'm only down here today because I had obligations in Albuquerque, and I came up here for the afternoon. Uh, that's fine with the state, Your Honor. When we get to the point of resetting it, I would ask that you give me a brief moment so I can bring everybody in so we can clear, let them all know and make sure they're not going to be out of town and things like that. Um, but uh, I think that plan works for the state. All right. Yeah. And I think they need to be admonished that the subpoena is still valid, although it's now going to be – we're going to have to issue – I now can consent to be issued <laughs> subpoenas. Uh, my witnesses will be there up in TA or whatever your setting is. Thank you. Well, 
Then we'll take evidence from the state regarding pretrial detention at this time. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm uh, asking uh, you to place uh, Matthew Jacobs under oath and calling him as a witness. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. You may be seated. If you begin your testimony by stating your first and last name and spelling both for the record. Matthew Jacobs, M-A-T-T-H-E-W. Jacobs, J-A-C-O-V-S. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walquist, you may proceed. Thank you. And you're a certified full-time law enforcement officer with the uh, Santa Fe Sheriff's Department, or excuse me, the Re Reba County Sheriff's Department. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Um, are you uh, what we would call the case agent in this matter? I am. Okay. Uh, I'm going a little fast because we're now in the pretrial detention stage. It's a little different than the preliminary hearing, different rules. Um, so you were here and you heard the testimony of the first few civilian witnesses we brought in, correct? Correct. Um, so we've heard some testimony about what happened kind of that night. Um, what happened the next day on June 2nd, 2024? Uh, the next day, uh, approximately 3, 3.30 p.m., um, I received a call from Lieutenant Casillas um, to respond to approximately the one mile marker on 595 uh, near Lindreth uh, for the report of a possible homicide, a body found on the side of the road. And who was that body on the side of the road? It was later identified as Trent Green. Uh, when you say on the side of the road, exactly where is it, where was Trent's body in relation to the the dance hall that we've been hearing testimony about? Uh, I would guess approximately three, four miles um, south of the dance hall. Uh, was it on a road towards the uh, uh, dance hall or was it somewhere else? Uh, it was on the, the main road to Lindreth uh, and then the dance hall is off to the east side of it. I think we heard testimony from one witness who talked about you're going up a road and then you got to take a left to the uh, dance hall to the fairgrounds or the rodeo. Where was Trent in that? And first of all, is that accurate? Uh, so the rodeo grounds is, is on the east side of the road. Uh, 595 runs north and south. Um, the rodeo grounds is, is on the uh, on the east side. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, and then. Trent's body was approximately three to four miles south, uh, closer to the 96 junction. Okay. So not on that road directly to the rodeo, but on 595? Correct. Okay. About three miles? Approximately. From the dance hall? Correct. Okay. Um, uh, did uh, eventually you go through the steps to get Trent's body to the office of the medical examiner for an autopsy? I did. Did you uh, attend that autopsy? I did. Uh, what were the results of that? Um, Dr. Darrell had reported that uh, Trent Green died from a singular uh, gunshot wound traveling from the left to the right. Um, I'd have to refer to my report for the specifics, um, but traveling in a slightly upward trajectory, uh, striking both lungs and the vertebrae. Were there any other sort of uh, injuries to uh, Trent? Uh, he had abrasions, um, I believe, on his lower back, if I remember correctly, and then uh, I believe he had abrasions on his hands. Um, based on your investigation and what you've, because we heard some testimony from some witnesses, we we're going to hear from a lot more, and we will at the when we finish the preliminary hearing. Briefly, kind of walk us through what happened. There was a fight, gunshots. What happened? Because I'm confused as to how Trent gets shot. So, so from all the uh, witness testimony uh, that I was able to get, uh, or witness statements, I should say, uh, that I was able to get, there was a fight that broke out between uh, Coy, um, Colton, the, that family. Um, there was a lot of people involved. And then Derek and his brother had left um, in two separate trucks, from what I knew. Um, from what I understood, the trucks left. A short uh, distance later, they, they turned around, uh, came back. And that's whenever they uh, were met at the road near the entrance of the rodeo grounds by Trevor Case. Um, and then as Trevor Case testified, uh, those events folded, unfolded. Um, but from what I understand, Trevor Case's uh, witness statement to me was that he was in his vehicle talking to Miguel. Um, he started getting his, his truck started getting shot at. He felt glass on his face, uh, realized that he was being shot at. So um, he shot back at the Toyota Tundra. Uh, that he was able to describe to me. Based on your investigation, could you determine if uh, anybody other than 
Derek Madrid and Trevor Case ever fired any shots? No. No, you couldn't determine, or no, you determined nobody did? I determined that there was no other shooters. Okay. After what happened between Trent and the trucks, the Madrid's trucks, the Madrid's left at that point, correct? From what I understand is that both trucks went back in the rodeo grounds. For the duration of time, I'm not clear on that. But there was, both trucks did end up going back into the rodeo grounds, and that was the, Mr. Case went inside the rodeo, the dance hall, to warn people that they were coming back. Okay. Through your investigation, were you ever able to locate the truck you believe that Derek Madrid was in? I was. Where was it? San Luis, if my directions are right, south of Cuba, on the way to Albuquerque. Is that where Derek Madrid lives? As far as I know, correct. Okay. And was it a Sandoval County Sheriff's deputy that found that truck? Yes. Did you eventually execute a search warrant on that truck? I did. What did you find inside Derek Madrid's truck? I found multiple bullet casings. There was two bullet holes on the outside of the truck, one that I was actually directed to by Derek's mother, Monica Estrada. It was near the lower portion of the front driver's side, so where the driver sits. There was a bullet hole there, and then also a bullet hole in the rear driver's side, approximately in the center of the door. We're going to get way more detailed testimony later on at the preliminary hearing, both from you and other witnesses. But as you were collecting the truck and doing that, did you get any statements from Derek Madrid or any of the Madrids, really, about what happened? Not the Madrids. Madrid's mother was there, Monica Estrada. Monica Estrada, who is Derek and Miguel's mother? Correct. Okay. What did Monica Estrada say to you? So initially, while we were waiting on the warrant, she had made what I would call a spontaneous utterance that Miguel was beat up, that they were trying to kill her sons, and that they drove away. Other statements included such as they tried to resuscitate Trent on the side of the road, and that they called Sandoval County, which was then transferred to Rio Riba. And then she said that they brought the truck home because they were scared. I asked her who was driving or who was in the vehicle. She had told me Derek was driving and who she referred to as JB, the youngest son, were in the vehicle. And she made the statement multiple times, if I remember correctly, that Trent died in the back of that truck, and I needed to get it. She was very – she really wanted me to get the truck. She wanted me to cut the lock and get inside. And that would be the lock to the property where – Correct. The truck was. Okay. As you were going through that, you said that Monica Estrada said that they, presumably talking about Derek and Miguel, had called 911 and it went from – to different counties. Correct. Did you do anything to verify or confirm that? I did. What did you learn? So initially I contacted Sandoval County, and I was able to get a recording and what we call CAD notes, computer-aided dispatch. I was able to get those notes. And on the recording, I can hear what I believe to be Miguel, and he identifies himself as Miguel Madrid. He stated to Sandoval County that they were involved in an incident tonight in Lindreth, and they heard the cops were looking for them. Sandoval, if I remember correctly, said something along the lines of, well, that's Rio Riva County. If you want to talk to Rio Riva County, we'll transfer you. And they did. And then after that, I completed an IPRO request for the records for Rio Riva County. Very similar call. Miguel Madrid identified himself by name, date of birth, and phone number. And then he said – When were these calls made? I would have to, again, check my report to be completely accurate, but I believe it was somewhere around 4.30 to 5 o'clock in the morning. Not long after the incident at the dance hall? The incident at the dance hall happened approximately four or five hours earlier. Okay. So it was four or five hours later that Miguel was making these calls? Correct. When you got the IPRO request from Rio Riva County, 
What did you hear on those calls? Uh, basically, the same thing it said in Sandoval uh, County 911 is that he was involved in an incident tonight in Lindreth, um, and he heard that the cops were looking for him. Um, Any mention of Trent or anybody being hurt? No. For the purposes of this uh, pretrial detention portion of the hearing, Your Honor, I don't have any other questions at this time, and I pass the witness. Cross-examination. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective, I take it uh, with great detention, you did an NCIC check on Derek Madrid, did you not? I would, I would assume so. I'm sure you <laughs> Uh, yes, and by virtue of the National Crime Information Center, you were able to determine that Derek Madrid has no prior felony convictions. You know that. Correct. He has no misdemeanor convictions. Correct. And I take it you uh, determined that he is full-time employed. That I wasn't able to determine, uh, but I heard. Well, I can hear say, but where, did, where does he work that you heard? I believe I heard that he worked on a ranch or... Something like that. Okay. To be honest with you, I don't know. Okay. But uh, you had reason to believe he's gainfully employed. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I would assume. Yeah. Um, next, um, we'll talk about evidence in a bit, but the criminal complaint in this case, where you're the affiant, was filed in magistrate court in Rio Riva on September 4th of this year. Do you recall that? Yes. Obviously, a warrant was issued by virtue of this complaint being filed and signed off by a judge, correct? Correct. And But you didn't execute the warrant at, a, at first, did you? Uh, execute the arrest warrant? Well, yeah, you didn't go, you knew where Derek lived, and I'm saying you didn't go uh, for a period of almost 12 days. There was no attempt to arrest him in any way. Correct. Was there any reason for that? I was told by my superiors, um, because it was in Sandoval County, uh, I tried to coordinate, uh, however, um, just Unfortunately, a busy time trying to coordinate with Sandoval County or New Mexico State Police uh, just didn't happen at that time. However, those authorities were notified. Okay. Well, it made uh, it made the news uh, the fact that this uh, criminal complaint was filed. And it made TV as well, didn't it? I think I read it in the newspaper. I don't, I don't watch that kind of TV. Well, what I'm getting at is um, you ultimately received a call from my office, and you were told that Derek would self-surrender. He, he learned about the criminal complaint, uh, even though the warrant at that point theoretically would have been sealed, but he actually came to your office and self-surrendered, didn't he? Correct. What, tell the court when he did that. Um, approximate date, two weeks ago, um, I believe. So two. Friday, uh, a week and a half ago. But okay, yeah. But I can get the I'll date. Take your word but all for I'm it. saying is that, um, well, by virtue of that, you could... Um, you have no information that uh, Derek Madrid attempted to flee at any point from June 1st or June 2nd until the time uh, he self-surrendered once he realized there was a warrant. There was never an attempt at flight, right? Flight? I don't know that I would call it flight. However, whenever I initially talked to Miguel, because um, he had requested to talk with the deputy, um, like I was uh, telling Mr. Walquist, you know, that message was eventually given to a, a deputy, a sergeant. Uh, however, we had not found Mr. Green's body yet, and so um, the, the call was held off. Uh, after the discovery of the body several hours later, um, I had learned, because I wasn't on duty that day, I had learned that Miguel wanted to talk uh, and make a statement. Uh, when I had called him, I asked if I could come meet him somewhere, because we were near Cuba, and I uh, was told that they lived in Cuba. Uh, however, they went to what I was told was Albuquerque, or I believe Rio Rancho, um, and that they would not not come and, and speak with me. Um, As their constitutional right is. Exactly. Okay, but what I'm getting at, in this case, there was no attempt by Derek Madrid to flee uh, the jurisdiction in any way, because that's one of the issues is the judge has to determine this, some kind of flight risk. And in this case, there's no evidence that Derek Madrid poses a risk of flight that if he was released, given the fact he self-surrendered, you have no evidence that he would take off. Fair statement? No evidence, correct. Okay. 
Now let's go back to uh, a little bit of the evidence collection. Let's start with uh, the scene. I take it there was a thorough canvas in front of where the, uh, the dance was, as well as where the, the trucks are parked and things like that, correct? I would assume so, yes. Well, you're, you're the case agent, so you're kind of the repository of all that information, aren't you? So because the two incidents were, were separated by several hours, uh, the initial call of the shots fired at the rodeo grounds and then the discovery of the body, um, by the time I had gotten there, there was a whole another day of the rodeo that had happened, um, and it was well into the night. Um, so at that moment, uh, specifically, no, there was not a canvas done. Um, however, the night before, when the, the, the responding patrol deputies uh, responded, that's when they did the canvas, correct? Okay. Uh, there were not co were shells collected at that portion of uh, the fairgrounds. So in front of the uh, dance hall and where this fight took place near the dance hall, there's no shell casings in that area were there. Near the roadway there was. Okay, and that's the roadway, you're talking about the highway, correct? Yes. And that is approximately four to 500 yards from the dance hall? Approximately, yes. Yeah, because you have to take that little dirt road correct. off the highway. So four to 500 yards away is the first time that you are locating shell casings? The responding deputies the night before, correct? Yeah, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying you personally, I'm yeah. going to say you leading uh, an investigative team. So the idea that there were 50 or 60 shots uh, in that vicinity, uh, there were not 50 to 60 shell casings at all, were there? Recovered, no. And even three or four, and, and there's di different witnesses have talked about it. The reality is you didn't find any shell casings except for by the roadway, right? Correct. Okay. Now, um, Trevor Case, he, uh, when he told you he fired and discharged a gun, you collected that gun, co correct? Yes. Uh, it's a Glock, 40 caliber? Yes. And I take it you're underway still with forensics um, to determine that there was a, um, a bullet fragment recovered from Derek Madrid's vehicle, right? Uh, not that I remember, no. Well, there's two shots to the vehicle that you've taken pictures of. One, Correct. clearly, uh, it's dead center in the rear, uh, uh, the rear passenger behind the driver's side. Correct. Correct. And there's also a bullet hole that is closer to what would be underneath the driver's seat. Slow. Correct. Correct. Did you not obtain projectiles from either one of those? We did not. Okay. Um, at the autopsy, did they? capture a projectile? I, didn't, I don't have the autopsy yet, but they... they preliminarily, uh, they did not, know. Okay. Um, the, some of the videos that you came up and watched, um, so there's one of the melee, and you can see there's a lot of people fighting one person. Is that a fair characterization? I mean, in a very short clip? Yeah. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't say. Well, did you study the clip where you can see uh, Derek Madrid, and he's actually pulling his brother's arm. Have you seen that? Uh, believe the yes, I, I believe I know which video you're talking about. And, and you can see Derek has a handgun in his hand. Correct. And that handgun was never pointed at anybody as he's trying to get his brother out of there, right? There's nobody who says they pointed. A, he pointed a gun at me. In that very short clip, yes. Well, not not just he doesn't in the clip, but there's no witnesses who are saying he was pointing the gun or, or he ever shot the gun. Uh, while he's trying to get his brother out. That never occurred. To my knowledge, um, he never pointed at anybody uh, at, you know, in that video. No, he doesn't point at anybody. Okay. Now, in the search of Trevor's vehicle, when he cut the locks, and again, his mother wants you to take it because you know it has, that's the Toyota Tundra, correct? Correct. And um, two bullet holes in that as well as uh, there was a blood stain in the back, correct? Correct. And that was directly behind the driver's seat. Correct. Uh, that was the, it was, it was a big stain, was it not? It appeared to be, yes. Okay, but there were no other blood stains on the other, the other half of the back seat or in the front, anything like that? 
Uh, to my knowledge, there was blood, uh, what I would call spatter or blood droplets, um, I believe on the driver's side uh, door. And then if I remember correctly, um, near the door jam, what, what law enforcement called a B post, I believe that there was some. I've just seen the photographs. I just got them yesterday, but I'm going yeah. through. But the majority of it looks like Mr. Green was sitting behind Derek, who was driving that truck, and got shot in that back seat because that's where all the blood is. That would make logical sense to you, would it not? Yes. And actually, that would line up with the bullet hole that you've taken a picture of that is uh, dead center on that side of the car uh, where Mr. Green would have been sitting, right? Correct. So with that, uh, I guess it's your theory. I mean, it's, it's not your theory that Derek turned around and shot Mr. Green in the back seat of his own truck, correct? Correct. So somebody else shot, there's an exchange of gunfire, and someone else shot, the two it, that hit uh, the Toyota Tundra, one of which killed Trent Green. But the, that shooter was not Derek Madrid, right? To the best of my knowledge, correct. And at this point, the only other person who admits that he fired at that vehicle is Trevor Case, right? Correct. He hasn't been charged with anything? Correct. I have no other questions, Your Honor. Uh, no redirect, Your Honor. May this uh, witness step down and come back to council table. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Stacey, next witness, if any. Uh, for the pretrial detention portion of the hearing, no further witnesses. I would ask uh, to admit state exhibits one and two that were uh, attached to the state's expedited motion for pretrial detention. I have extra copies here. I have them right here. Okay. Any objection to state exhibit one and two that were attached to the state's motion for pretrial detention on September 20th? No, Your Honor, one is a public record, the affidavit, uh, and then we have the pretrial services report. Um, that one. Well, yeah, in the back. Yeah, that's, that's two. I have no objection to two, Your Honor. Um, one and two are admitted. Uh, Your Honor, I have no further witnesses or evidence regarding pretrial detention. Uh, before we move to argument, I would ask for two-minute break so that I can inform all the witnesses that are outside what's going on, and I think actually many of them would want to come in to hear the argument portion. Any evidence? I have no evidence other than what's been elicited already, Your Honor. I do Where does your client live? Uh, uh, just outside of Cuba, Your Honor. Who does he live with? With his parents? Yeah, with his parents, and I, mom, dad, Younger brother, Jonathan. Are you the father? Is your wife here? The only other individual that lives at the house is Miguel. Does Miguel live out there? During the day? Yes. So you're away from the residence? We all work together. Oh, you work together. What do you do for work? So your son, the one sitting right here, Derek, works with you all day? Thank you, sir. You may bring in these individuals for purposes of argument. Thank you, Your Honor.
knew there was something wrong. Thank you, Your Honor. I believe everybody that would like to uh, hear this happen is, is here. All right. Argument from the state. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Going through the uh, five, four, or nine factors in the state's motion for pretrial detention, we'll start with the uh, facts and circumstances of this offense. We heard just the initial uh, uh, testimony. Um, we did hear a little bit more from the officer during the pretrial detention part of the hearing, and you get some in uh, State Exhibit 1, which is the affidavit for arrest warrant. And so you do get, I think, some of the minutia we're going to argue about later when we finish up the testimony at the preliminary hearing and we hear from the other witnesses. But what's clear is what happened is the uh, defendant brought a, a gun to a fist fight and then while it was being broken up and then while he was leaving, he fired off several shots. We did hear um, some differing testimony about exactly when or how many or that sort of thing. Uh, but it is clear that shots were fired. Um, in State Exhibit 1, uh, we do have uh, information about um, witnesses saying that it was Derek that testified. Again, I think we'll get more details about that when we finish the preliminary hearing with the other dozen or so witnesses uh, that would testify. The defendant's firing off shots in a crowd. We heard testimony about how many people were there, how many young people were there. Uh, there were, um, I think the youngest we heard testimony about was 12 um, uh, that was there. And he's firing off shots into this crowd. And then even while he's leaving, the defendant is firing shots while this happens. And then he leaves. It's done. It's over with. But the defendant comes back. And we heard the testimony about that. And even the witness who testified tried to say, it's done. You can just leave. It's done. And it wasn't done for the defendant. And he fired off more shots. Um, the nature and circumstances of this offense, it's clearly dangerous. The defendant put everybody 
at, at that event in danger. Um, and Trent Green, who's, I think we're going to end up hearing testimony about, it, is a friend of, of uh, the defendant in the defendant's car, but it ends up dead because of the defendant's actions. Uh, so this was a very serious offense. Um, it is a very serious incident and very, very dangerous. Um, I think we might, yeah, it's just extremely dangerous as to what happened. Going to the next factor, which is the weight of the evidence against the, the defendant. Um, usually we're past the preliminary hearing stage in that, so we can make that argument. Um, so, of course, my position is that the state's evidence is strong. We still have several more witnesses. Even the um, somewhat inconsistent testimony we were hearing was still fairly consistent about the general uh, nature of what was happening and that it was, um, and we'll get more evidence later, I believe that it was the defendant shooting and that was the defendant uh, doing the initial shooting when nobody else was. Um, so and so, do you have a witness that will say that it was the defendant who was shooting after the physical altercation? In State's Exhibit 1, uh, which is the affidavit for arrest warrant, it does uh, mention a witness who said that. And then with respect to the encounter with Trevor Case at the entry to the fairgrounds, Mr. Case identified that not only were shots being fired from the front driver's seat of the, the black tundra, which is identified as the defendant, but also that shots were being fired from the pa front passenger seat. Is there any way for the state to distinguish whose shots caused the three pings that Trevor Case identified prior to his windshield then shattering as a result of a shot? Are you able to identify that it was the defendant that fired those shots that caused the three pings and the windshield to shatter? Uh, Your Honor, at this point, no, we are not. Uh, once towards the at the end of the preliminary hearing part of the hearing, when we start arguing the law and the uniform jury instructions, I would read into the record accessory liability um, that it doesn't matter who the principal is or the accessory. New Mexico law does not differentiate between principal and accessory liability. So whether it was the passenger via, uh, shooter. Uh, hitting Trevor Case's car or the defendant in the driver's seat hitting Trevor, Case, uh, Trevor Case's car. If it was the passenger, if Trevor Case, in all the actions I just described, and then also in shooting, if, even if it was up in the air at that point, helped encourage or cause the passenger to shoot at Trevor Case's vehicle, um, he could be liable for that, Your Honor. And so it, at this point, for preliminary hearing or pretrial detention, I would argue to the court it doesn't actually matter. They were both shooting. Do you know who that passenger was? Uh, we believe uh, we know who it is, and it might have been a sibling. Uh, give me one moment. Um, I believe we're getting into speculation um, for a potential witness who's in the courtroom right now, and so he's probably about to hear me accuse him of something that we don't actually know. So we are speculating. We think it might have been the Jonathan uh, mentioned the younger uh uh, I believe it was a friend and sibling. Was, he, Jonathan was described as both. And I apologize, he's here and he can explain his uh, uh, connection to everybody. I wouldn't ask him to say anything about what happened in the truck at this point, but um, we believe it was Jonathan. Thank you. For does that, that answer the court's question? It does. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, I would argue that the uh, state's evidence is strong, um, even under accessory liability if it was the passenger actually hitting. But again, it's actually the whole incident the leave, shooting, leaving, shooting while leaving, turning around and coming back, uh, all of that. Um, I think the weight of the evidence is strong. Uh, the nature and seriousness of the danger to the victim or the community. Uh, again, this kind of dovetails about the nature and circumstances of the offense. Uh, the defendant um, used a gun multiple times around a crowd and could have hurt so many people in this. And one person ended up paying uh, with their life based on what the defendant was doing. And so he does pose a significant danger to the community um, of potentially uh, death or, or a serious injury uh, to anybody who was there around him if he decides to act out again. 
Your Honor, moving to the history and characteristics of the defendant, I believe multiple times the defense has pointed out that the defendant has never been convicted of a felony or even a misdemeanor. I would concede that that is true. In State Exhibit 2, it does mention another criminal case out of, I believe it's Sandoval County, excuse me, an aggravated burglary armed after entering case D-132 CR-2024-9. That case was eventually dismissed for insufficient evidence. It's not part of the record, but I do have the criminal complaint that gives the circumstances of that offense. And I'm surprised it took so long for the state to dismiss the aggravated burglary. What happened was the defendant had a gun in his car and, okay, the defendant had a gun in his car and then somebody said, hey, somebody stole that gun out of my house. And the officer in a very sparse one paragraph statement of probable cause says, well, I'm charging you with aggravated burglary. So that is the defendant's history is he once had a gun that somebody said had been stolen from that person. That is all the defendant has in his history. Turning to whether at the time of this offense the defendant was on any conditions of release or other factors indicating the defendant may commit new crimes if released. He was not on probation or conditions of release at the time of this incident, Your Honor. The state's basing this motion really on the extended nature of this where the defendant was out of danger. His brother, Miguel, was out of danger, which may have started this whole thing, which is what I think we heard from the defense's opening statement for the preliminary hearing. It was over and it was done. And the defendant still came back and started firing shots unprovoked. And Trent Green ended up paying with the dime from those actions. And so, Your Honor, based on all that, I'm asking that you find that the defendant is dangerous and that there are no reasonable conditions of release to protect the community. I think EM house arrest, even with allowing him to work with his family, his dad, from my understanding, wasn't there. He wasn't a witness, but everybody else in his family seems to be there playing a significant role, potentially inculpatory if it was Jonathan firing the other shots from the passenger side. Whatever else Miguel may have been doing, putting him on house arrest or EM where he has to stay around other witnesses, potential co-defendants, just isn't good under 5409. And it would, I think, impede this case moving forward. So I am asking that you find that he is dangerous and that there are no reasonable conditions of release to protect the community. And I would ask that you grant the state's motion. So I know you haven't presented your evidence in its entirety for probable cause determination, but if you could entertain the court with your argument as to element three of felony murder, which requires that Derek Madrid intended to kill or knew that his acts created a strong probability of death or great bodily harm. Certainly, Your Honor. A lot of this will also get into the causation definition, which is in UGI 14-17505. So, Your Honor, when the defendant initially shot and then left and shot while he was leaving, and we heard that it was several minutes later, the defendant came back, turned around, was coming back, and unprovoked started firing multiple shots into a vehicle. You don't do that unless you're intending to kill somebody. And so that would be his intention, is he was intending to kill whoever was in that car. It happened to be Trevor Case, but he was intending to kill whoever was in that other car. And as the defense mentioned in their opening statement for preliminary hearing, their theory is that somebody else shot first, and the defendant was exercising his right to defend himself, that it's reasonable to defend yourself. And so they mentioned that during their opening. It's the exact same for the state's theory of the case. When the defendant intended to kill somebody starts shooting at another car, it's reasonable and legal for that person to start shooting back, and it's foreseeable. And so the definition of the causation in 14-1705, for you to find that the death in this case was caused by the conduct of the defendant, if I may say it, it's easier for me to... But let me ask you this. Okay. If you can't establish that he was the one shooting into the vehicle, I understand your accessory liability idea. 
if maybe he's just shooting in the air and the passenger is shooting into the vehicle, how do you transfer even to the accessory's intention to his intention to kill? There is no other reason to fire into a car, Your Honor. That would be the state's position. There's no other reason to leave a fight, that the fight's over, and then coming back. If Trevor Case had been killed, the argument would be a deliberation, because the deliberation was the fight was over, the defendant was down the road, the defendant turned around and came back, he deliberated during that time, and that is the intent to kill. But if he's just shooting in the air, because you can't establish that he's shooting in the car, his intention isn't to kill, it's just to shoot in the air. And I understand you have an accessory liability idea, but he also has to encourage that to happen. And if he's just shooting in the air, if anything, he's encouraging the other person, if anything, to shoot in the air. And if that person takes it upon themselves to then shoot in the car, how do you transfer that intent? Understood, Your Honor. The investigation is still ongoing. I think the defense has also pointed that out, that we're still waiting on some ballistics, some forensic evidence. I would argue that eventually we may have that evidence and show that it was the defendant that did it. And right now, all I can argue is the evidence in front of you, that it was the defendant firing at Trevor Case. Now let me ask you this. Assuming that it is Derek Madrid who's shooting into Trevor Case's vehicle, the intention to kill would be to Trevor Case, not the gentleman in the seat behind him. Is there a transfer of intent that would be argued? And the causation, Your Honor. Dovetailing off of what the defense has already pointed out, which is it's reasonable and legal for somebody to defend themselves. And that was when I would get into the causation definition, that it is an actual result of the conduct. If it weren't for the defendant shooting at Trevor Case, Trevor Case wouldn't have shot back. And that the natural sequence of events by the defendant's act to the resulting death or destruction was not interrupted by any other intervening cause. So it's, I think the defense was arguing this, or not arguing because it was opening statement, but pointing out that it would be reasonable and legal for somebody to defend themselves by shooting back. So when the defendant fires into Trevor Case's vehicle, it is foreseeable that Trevor Case would fire back and that somebody might die. And so, yes, transferred intent and the causation, Your Honor. And I believe what we're getting at right now is into the second element, which is the strength of the state's case, which is just one of the factors for 5409. Thank you for answering my questions. Anything further? Nothing further from the state, Your Honor. Argument from the defense. Court's questions, I'm not, I was going to raise, but you've already raised them. Your Honor, there's one key fact here is that from that video, you can see Derek trying to get his brother out, but there's no gun play. You've already heard Miguel didn't start the fight. It all starts with the group there. And Colton, he admitted he, you know, he threw the first punch and that got it all on. I mean, the Madrid boys, they didn't start anything at that thing. It all started with a group. And then you can see the melee. It's really Miguel trying to hold off 10 to 12 people. What's significant is there's no gun play there. Just like Trevor Case had a right to possess a gun, so did Derek. And it wasn't used. It was never used at the fairgrounds. And it's going to be, when we get all the forensics, it is five to 600 yards away that that's where the casings are found. The individuals back at the fairgrounds, they're five to 600 yards away. They were never in danger. And the question will be, who fired first? I guess they believe wholeheartedly Trevor Case by himself, but he then has to drive. And it's a question of who chased who. They're leaving. Why does Trevor Chase go five to 600 yards out to the highway? Because that's where this gun play and who's shooting first and who's pissed off about the whole thing. And it will be a self-defense case in part. But this 
the evidence is pathetically weak at this point. Um, when you look at the 5401C C1 factor and the weight factor, um, the, the reality is Derek never, no one else was hurt. The only, a group started a fight, got upset. Derek tries to leave, and they're 600 yards away. And that's where, from even the case agent says, that's where the, the shell casings are. Nobody's hurt back there. Your Honor, uh, it is an unusual case where in this felony murder, I mean, we, we will be litigating this not just at the end of the probable cause, but there will be a fool and font motion after we've done all of the – it's purely legal. And the question is, uh, I've never heard of <laughs> – the predicate for the felony would be shooting out of a car, but someone else shot into the car and clearly killed the person in the back seat. He's not even the shooter. I, I've never seen something so, uh, and we, all these felony murder cases that are, is this attenuated, uh, and, or I should say, uh, you have to have an intent to kill the person who's killed. I don't think there is transferred intent. But having said that, um, with the recommendation of ROR, uh, factoring in his employment, I would ask that you, um, set restrictive conditions, maybe not per se ROR. But in this case, that ranch, and Derek just corrected his father, there's closer to four to 4,500 head of cattle. There's over 20,000 acres. It's a very large family ranch. It's been in the family for a long period of time. You've heard it's got various parcels to it, but can be reached by dirt roads. Um, I'm asking that he be released um, to the ranch, to the custody of his parents, uh, there'll be a condition you can't talk about the case, and they haven't. Uh, he has been completely compliant. I think it says a lot when someone self-surrenders. Uh, when he's, I mean, they, they can't jurisdictionally somehow find the time in 12 days, but he turns himself in. Um, the ranch is large, and he could, uh, as I say, be confined there, uh, with the exception of uh, I'm sure his mother would bring him with him, or if he drove himself to come to my office in Albuquerque. Uh, I don't, but I obviously have to meet with him frequently, and I don't really plan on driving out to the ranch and trying to find, I mean, I would, I would ask that he just be confined to the ranch so that he can work, and the only exception being he can drive to Albuquerque when we have uh, an attorney conference set up. And I think the other factors are all kind of answered, and we went through them all, but uh, he's not a flight risk. Um, I think the case is, I, I think the evidence is actually incredibly weak. He hasn't any history of violence, <coughs> characteristics that would include um, any felony conduct before. I mean, he's a hardworking young man brought into a situation that he, he didn't go to that fight with an intent to kill somebody. He's trying to get his brother out of a melee. And the question is, why was Mr. Case chasing him all the way out as they're trying to leave? You're hear, as they're leaving, he's five to 600 yards down the, uh, down the road with his gun firing away. But that'll be, you know, we'll see how this comes out later on at the end of the prelim and, and maybe even at a trial. But uh, this is not a typical murder case. And I ask that you release him as the recommendation provides. Do you have any questions? Of me? I don't. Thank you, Your Honor. Any reply from the state? No, Your Honor.
Well, firstly, I'd just like to say that what I've heard about happening on June 1st of 2024 is an absolute tragedy, that a young man would lose his life over circumstances of extreme intoxication, male egos, and irresponsible gun use. But the court must weigh the factors contained in Rule 5-409 to determine whether or not Derek Madrid should be held in custody during the pendency of this case before this court. And the first factor is the nature and circumstances of the offense charged, including whether the offense is a crime of violence. In the court's mind, whether or not this is a crime of violence really hinges upon the intentionality of the death in this circumstance. And it seems to the court that neither Mr. Madrid nor Mr. Case had that intention for Mr. Green to sustain the injury that he did, which caused his death. The actions that I've heard regarding Mr. Madrid are extremely juvenile, extremely irresponsible, and extremely reckless. However, the court has not heard specific evidence to show that he directed his gunshots at one particular individual, but just shot at random, endangering a number of individuals. And therefore, the court has a difficult time identifying his behavior as being violent to any one particular individual. At most, it's a general violence in the sense that his actions involve discharging a firearm, which is lethal force wielded irresponsibly, recklessly. The nature and circumstances of the offense show that Mr. Madrid, for some reason, couldn't let go what he had just driven away from, and for some reason, felt it necessary to return to prove some type of point, which sadly resulted in the death of an individual, but not at his hand, potentially based upon circumstances that he created. The weight of the evidence being the second factor, the state's theory of the case requires a number of legal gymnastics to reach an idea of felony murder and transferred intent and causation. The evidence to show that Mr. Madrid was the individual who shot at the vehicle occupied by Trevor Case is not strong. It requires potentially an application of accessory liability, and it requires inference from very circumstantial evidence. And therefore, the court cannot find that the weight of the evidence weighs in the state's favor. With respect to the history and characteristics of the defendant, the defendant doesn't have any prior criminal history except for one charge of aggravated burglary, which having read the criminal complaint and probable cause statement filed on June 14th of 2023 in case M46FR2023-36 is 
an extremely weak case that most likely should have never been charged against Mr. Madrid in the first place. And that being the only matter in his criminal history, the court finds that there is no criminal history associated with Mr. Madrid. With respect to characteristics, as I've already stated, for some reason Mr. Madrid had no ability to let go of what happened at the fairgrounds and then to just go back to his residence and forget what happened. For some reason there was some type of bruised ego, it seems, that needed to be redeemed by a return, which is extremely drastic in its manner, not only by Derek Madrid, but I heard testimony from Mr. Davis regarding a circle through the fairgrounds performed by his brother discharging a firearm. So the court finds that the characteristics of the defendant's reckless behavior are of concern to the court. The nature and seriousness of the danger to any person or the community that would be posed by the defendant's release is the fourth factor to be considered by this court. Mr. Madrid, other than this incident, has no involvement in the criminal justice system to identify that beyond the circumstances of recklessness, irresponsibility, and an inability to control those types of behaviors doesn't present a danger to any particular person except for the community at large if such behavior were to occur again. The fifth factor is that any facts tending to indicate that the defendant may or may not commit new crimes if released. Now in light of his lack of criminal history, this seems to be an aberration, but a great aberration at that. Whether or not he would commit new crimes if released depends on the circumstances of his release. If they are strict enough to remove the factors that contributed to his behavior that evening, the court believes that the threat of new crimes being committed upon his release can be suppressed. A public safety assessment of Mr. Madrid indicates that he should be released on the lowest of circumstances, released on his own recognizance. which is a reflection of the fact that he has no criminal history, and this is his first involvement in the criminal justice system regarding charges that have evidence to support them far beyond what was charged regarding the aggravated burglary. Having weighed all of those considerations, the court finds that it's appropriate to release Mr. Madrid on strict conditions. He'll be placed on an electronic monitor to reside with his parents at their residence. He will have a curfew of 8 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock in the morning. From 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., he will not be permitted to leave the residence. From 8 o'clock a.m. to 8 p.m., he may leave only for purposes of assisting his father in the work that needs to be done on the ranch. He is to be in his father's care and custody at all times. He is to be within eyesight of his father at all times. 
if he is not in his father's eyesight, I am ordering his father to report that at once to pretrial services to inform the court that his son is in, not in compliance with that requirement. He will not be permitted to possess any weapons and specifically firearms. And I understand that work on a ranch may require that type of instrument, but he is not to be in possession of one at any time. Any firearms in the residence must be locked in a safe at all times so that he has no access to firearms. If his father needs to carry a firearm for purposes of daily work, that firearm is to stay in his father's possession at all times out of his reach. He is not to consume any alcohol or controlled substances, and he will be subject to random urinalysis to ensure that he is not consuming any alcohol or controlled substances. As the court has identified, the use of alcohol seems to be a great contributing factor to what occurred that night, along with his access to firearms, and therefore the court will require that pretrial services be imposed at a supervision level two with random urinalysis as determined by pretrial services. He will be in the presence of witnesses to the case. At no time are the witnesses or he to speak to one another regarding the circumstances of the evening in question. Beyond those specific conditions, general conditions of release will apply, such as Mr. Madrid shall not commit any new crimes while this matter is pending before this court. That includes federal crimes, state crimes, local ordinance violations. He'll be prohibited from, again, possessing any weapons, including firearms or ammunition. He'll be prohibited from possessing or consuming any alcohol or controlled substances. He'll be prohibited from having contact with any witnesses, victims, or co-defendants aside from the permissible contact that I've identified with his family members. He'll be prohibited from leaving the state. As the court has already indicated, he'll be on electronic monitoring house arrest, not permitted to leave the residence for any purpose between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., and aside from leaving the premises for purposes of working on the family ranch with his father, while at all times being in his father's presence, he will only be permitted to leave to attend to medical appointments and meeting with his lawyer in pre-scheduled, pre-noticed appointments. He'll have to provide 48 hours advance notice to pretrial services regarding his need to leave for purposes of those appointments. He's also going to need to inform pretrial services when he leaves the residence for purposes of working on the ranch with his father, identifying the time <coughs> frames that he'll be away, and as I've stated, no time frames outside of or within the hours of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. He'll be obligated to attend all hearings that are scheduled in his proceedings, and he'll be obligated to maintain weekly contact with his attorney. Mr. Madrid, this is a short lease for a purpose. I don't want to hear about any problems with you in compliance. I've tried to make it abundantly clear as to what they are, do you, within the way of your conditions, do you have any questions regarding what your conditions are? No, I understand, Your Honor. 
Do you understand that a violation of any one of those conditions of release could result in a bench warrant issuing for your arrest and you being held in pretrial detention during the pendency of this case? Yes, Your Honor. You need to report to pretrial services within 24 hours of your release from the detention center. The pretrial services office is in this building in Santa Fe. Even for re-arriva cases, it's in this building right here. Do I report here? Yes, on the third floor of this building is pretrial services and they will connect you with an electronic monitor. I need you to report here within 24 hours of your release, no later. Thank you. Is there any need for clarification of the court's ruling? No, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have one and it's the line of sight which I understand what you said. Eric Madrid, Derek's father, he does travel somewhat frequently, I know, to see bankers. He has to buy supplies. He's in Albuquerque. He's off the ranch a fair amount. And if the line of sight would mean Derek would have to go with him to all these places, I was, I understand there could be line of sight with regard to his mother as well. The court wants him to make sure he's there. If he's with his dad, he's going to have to travel. And I know his dad goes to Albuquerque twice a week, but there's, he's out buying things for the ranch frequently or selling. And I think that could be problematic because I don't, I would prefer not having Derek driving all over the state. It's not all over the state. It's Espanola, it's Cuba, it's Albuquerque. I'm not intending for him to leave the ranch or the residence with his father. When he leaves the residence to work on the ranch with his father, his father must maintain line of sight. I got that. If his father is not working on the ranch that day and he's going to Albuquerque to go to the bank, then Derek stays at the residence. Okay. That's, that clarifies that for me, Your Honor. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I'm sure he gets it. I understand now. Thank you. And at that point in time, then his mother will be responsible to inform pretrial services if he leaves the residence. Yes, Your Honor. Let me make sure that his mother and father are willing to accept this responsibility. Sir, what is your name? Mr. Madrid, are you willing to accept the responsibility of ensuring that if your son is not in compliance with my conditions of release, that you would inform pretrial services? And ma'am, what is your name? Estrada. Ms. Estrada, are you willing to report to pretrial services if your son is not in compliance with my conditions of release? Yes, sir. Thank you both. You may be seated. Mr. Walquist, was there something? I was going to ask if you wanted to make sure there was a podium to make sure they were on the record. I think we captured that sufficiently. Any other need for clarification? No, Your Honor. Not from the state. Let me find a date for you all to come to the courthouse in TA to complete the probable cause determination through a preliminary examination. Mr. Gorenz, I need you to prepare the order denying the state's request for pretrial detention. Yes, Your Honor. I'll have that to you, obviously, tomorrow. I'll dictate that to my paralegal, but I'm a little busy here in the next 48 hours. But I will get it to you tomorrow so that it can be signed and he can be released. All right. So I have time. No matter what, I'm going to have to clear my calendar to accommodate this. So I could clear my calendar on October 23rd, which is a Wednesday, from 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the afternoon for a four-hour period. Would that date and time work for the parties? Again, this would be at the courthouse in Tierra Maria. That I know, Your Honor. Yes, technically I am on a docket in Las Lunas, but I believe this case is going to be resolved. We've kind of agreed on it, so I will definitely make that date is available. It can make it work. 
if I can just inquire of all the state's witnesses. Uh, anybody not available on October 23 will be out in PA <coughs> because uh, they'll be in Taos. Um, I think that that day as well. Yeah, okay. Is it possible to do it? Um, we can make the 23rd work, Your Honor. Um, uh, the, the, the family uh, has an obligation in Taos that day. And that impacts critical witnesses to the probable cause determination? It, it doesn't impact witnesses, Your Honor. It, it, does, it, 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 it's the, it does not. It is the uh, – it's, it's the family members. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, you're not doing it. Sorry. I might be confusing. Okay. Yeah, so Take your time. She, she is a witness. I'm. My apologies. I was confusing uh, the names. Uh, sorry, Your Honor. There's a lot of people. Um, this is uh, Mrs. Davis. So we've heard from the other Davises, um, and so I think we would want to hear her testimony as well. My apologies. Thank you. Yeah. And the entire week of the 21st and the 25th, they would be unavailable. It, it's. It's a murder trial. My sister-in-law was murdered in Taos, and it starts on the 21st. And then the 25th, or the or my mother-in-law is there the 25th, the 21st. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about your loss, Miss. It's your mother-in-law that's a witness, and you're going with her? Uh, yes, and to be she was detaining me also. This was last time, but they didn't call me for this one. Okay. Is there any ability, Mr. Walquist, for you to coordinate with the prosecutors there and inform them that this individual would need to be available on that date and maybe they could find an excuse her for that particular date? If I could just... So if you thought it was the same thing, I got to get a hold of My mother-in-law. Okay. I think we can, Your Honor. Um, I think I can work with the uh, prosecutor in Taos to if she is a witness in that case, to not have her testify the afternoon of the 23rd. All right. And if that becomes a problem, please let me know, and I'll figure out a way to accommodate. Are there any other problems with anybody? No, oh, okay. So we will proceed to October 23rd, starting at 1 o'clock to 5 in the evening <coughs> at the courthouse in Tierra Maria for purposes of completing the preliminary examination. Is there anything else that needs to be addressed here today? Not from the state. No, Your Honor. Mr. Gorins, you're also going to have to prepare an order of release and an order setting conditions of release on top of the order denying pretrial detention. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming to the courthouse. Have a safe trip wherever you all are going. Thank you all. Courts and recess. All rise.